If the story you are about to see were the product of a writer's imagination, you might label it unbelievable. But these events actually took place on the streets and alleys and in the tenements where we filmed them, in the shadow of the bridge. What did you do after he fell down? I, I hit him. What did you have in your hand when you hit him? Piece of wood. And this piece of wood you had in your hand, what was on it? Uh, uh, what, what do you mean? On the end of the piece of wood, what was there? I don't remember. Please speak up so we can hear you. I don't remember. What was your answer? Please let the court hear it. Objection. Are you trying to make a fool of me? Your Honor, I cannot complete my examination if this idiot goes on interrupting. That is not a proper remark in reference to counsel. Gentlemen, your remarks are discourteous not only to one another, but to this court as well. well I realize everyone is very tired. Let's just confine ourselves to questions and answers. Get away from me. Don't lay a hand on me. Your Honor, this man wants to assault me. Your Honor, I did not assault him. Take the defendants out of here. I demand police protection from the prosecution. This court will be in order at once. This trial stands adjourned till 4 o'clock. The jury will be advised. Judge, may I have just a moment? Get that man out of here. Can I just say something to that? Oh, say get him out. Get him out. May I just pop him out? Get him out. What did I do? All right, stand there. Lean forward and press your hands up against the wall and freeze it. Where's the weapon? A weapon? A Bible. Maybe there's a gun in it. Who do you work for, the gang? Ah, it's just a Bible. Where's the gun? I don't have a gun. I'm a minister. Those are my ordination papers. You always carry ordination papers with you? What are you trying to hide? David Wilkerson. That your name? Yes. What are you doing here? I was trying to get permission from the judge to help those kids. With what? No evidence? All right, stand up now. Watch him. I'll go see what the judge wants to do about it. How do you think you can help those kids? I've, I've got a whole church full of people praying for them back in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> they better be praying for a miracle because the DA will burn those creeps. Give him back his Bible. All right, the judge said he won't press any charges that you'll agree not to come back here anymore. Now, what do you say? What the hell? These kids are not of your faith. Hey, Reverend, what's that book you got in your hand? The Bible. You ashamed of it? Of course not. Stop hiding it, then. Hold it up where we can see it. Start 
sleeping in the back seat. I dig. What if he wakes up? He look bad? He don't look too bad, but he don't look too good either. You choking up, baby. How are we going about this? Well, look, when he comes out of the car, you grab him like this. You hold on to him and I'll grab his wallet. You like that? Yeah, that's nice. OK, when he comes out, we'll just get on him, see? David Wilkerson. Little Bo Peep, Davy, baby. You can call me Bo. The dude that tried to slice you, that's my man, Bottle Cap. Hi, Bottle Cap. Hey, you made us bring that junk back here. Come on. You want me to whale tail on you? The fool's copping from my man. Get yourselves together. That's a real fine pair of shoes you got there. Sure wish you had me a fine pair of shoes like that. Thanks. Hey, do you know that gang, the Egyptian Kings? Yeah, they pretty bad, but it ain't the heaviest. Like, they wouldn't mess with the Mau Mau's or the Bishops. I took these shoes off of a wino. Must have athletes feet or something, because I'm always itching. Mau Mau's, huh? Sure would like to meet them. Is that your gang? What I need a gang for? I run alone. I ain't got no use for jitterbugging and getting messed up and cutting cats. Ain't no bread in it. Bo, you believe in God? I don't worry about him. I just worry about the pigs and hustling bread. Easy for you to talk about God. A rich man like you, with that bad car, and those fine shoes. God worries about you. You're on his mind right now. You better tell him to think a little harder, because he ain't coming through. What's the gag? You keep belly aching about shoes, put them on. I don't want your stinking shoes, man. Don't make a thing of it, just put them on. What are you going to wear? I've got another pair at home. Where's that? Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, beautiful, baby. Give me five. Look, you want to see the gang? I'll show you the gang. Let's get this chariot together, Davy, baby, and I'll take you to see some real boxes. Only don't go laying none of that God stuff on them, because they'll cut you so full of holes that you can sprinkle the grass in, which we'll call it Pennsylvania, just by drinking a glass of water. 
They got himself busted in the Egyptian king trial. Oh. <laughs> Leave him alone. That's his thing. And don't go trying to turn a trick on him. He popped that same smile on me in bottle cap. Hey, he wants to meet the gang. Why don't you take him inside? I can't. The mom, I was waiting for a walk concert with the bishops. My brother's inside. It's all right, boy. We'll go in. Oh, no. Wait a minute. Maybe it's better if I don't. Like I said, I'm a loner. And I just run dispatches from one gang or another. If I just, like, walk right in the clubhouse, I mean, they might not like it. You're just afraid they might cut you. Oh, go on. Take a man. Uh-uh. I ain't gonna get balled out. Unless you give me five dollars. Go on. You can turn them loose just inside the door. Five dollars is my price. Let's cool it, Davy, baby. Five bucks is this chick's top price. For that, you get two joints of marijuana, her body, and two bits change. Well, should I give her some money? Two bucks, top. You better make it three. You don't want to insult her pride. Cat can only swing two. Come on. I'm gonna go steal me some breakfast. All right, Bo. Thanks. Hey, you also can I come in? Your brother wouldn't think so. I brought a friend. Hey, man. The tennis club is down the block. You're stumbling around in my turf. He's okay, Chance. He's the preacher they dragged out and beat up for trying to help the Egyptian kings. Yeah? 
That's cool. Cool, man. Smoke my peace pipe. I will. Have my peace pipe. Have a piece of my pipe. Have a... Vaya, por Dios! ¿Qué haces aquí? What are you doing with that joint? I like it. It makes me feel sexy. You want me to embarrass you by slapping your face? You can't act like you own me. Get out of here. Hey, man, I'm walking on that grass. It's generally you blue. Oh. I want to stay! I want to be a dub! I keep on telling you that I want to be a dub! Look! Look at them! You want to be like them? You want to do what they're doing? I got to stop doing it sometime! Why can't I do it now? Tell the man we have arrived. We are the chosen people. We are the bishops. Big cat's the name, and jitterbug is my game. Now let's get this thing together, Ace. Time and place. Okay. Mr. Cool. Mr. Cool. <laughs> I like that. Israel. President. And I say the park. The turf under dispute. Symbolic to boot. <laughs> Monday. It'll be at 8, baby. Don't be late. Oh, man, not at night, man. We can't see these cats at night. My man, the warlord, Abdullah. You say the night time's no good. Too many pigs out at night. High noon, then. So that the schools ain't out. Yeah, right on, Cat. I like that. And if the pigs come, then we join forces and fight them together, you dig it? Agreed. What weapons? My warlord, Abdullah. Make it light on yourself. My warlord, Nikki. Zips, blades, Straights, chains, clubs. Anything goes. That's the way we like it, too. Wait a minute. No zips. Cops don't like shooting, even from a homemade job. You chicken? You go one on one with me, and you'll find out who's chicken. Hot lip. Oh, wait a minute now. You're going to assault my warlord. We're going to get this thing on right now. No, no, get out. 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 Okay. No zips. No guns at all. We'll just use blades, chains, and baseball bats. Blades, chains, baseball bats! <laughs> uh, can, can I? Can, can I say something? Well, I don't know, dude. Can you? I, uh, I, I just want to say that the, there's somebody who, who cares about you people, cares about you very much. In fact, he loves you, just, just like you are. Keep talking about me, baby. He knows about the drinking, the marijuana. La cucaracha, porque le falta. Marino la que fumar. He knows what you're looking for when you play with sex. We're looking to make love, not war. <laughs> all right, all right, everybody quiet now. OK, dude, you go ahead and rap. Anybody give you steam, I'll pound him in the creek. <laughs> he wants you to have what you're looking for. Groovy, where's his turn? Yeah, she mean, dude, the big man in the sky, lose the naked eye. Now, he's there, but where? <laughs> you, you, you guys talk about getting high. Well, God will get you high, but he won't let you down. What God are you talking about, Allah? Tell me, Preach, this God of yours, does he rumble? Yeah. Yeah, he rumbles. He's fighting for you right now. Who says he's fighting on? Is he with the bishops? Yeah, 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 yeah. baby, dig it. Or is he with the Mau Maus? That's right, huh? He, uh, he's with both of you. That's why I'm here. God sent me. 
Look, I'm scared. I know you guys could kill me. That's why I know God's on your side, because he's making me do what I'm doing. Big Cat, Mr. President, I'd like to shake your hand. Nikki, Mr. Warlord, how about it? I've got one thing to say to you. God loves you. Oh, yeah, now I dig it. You dragged this dude in here to pacify us. You thought maybe you was going to change our minds? The only thing we're going to change is your lip. We're going to push it up into your nose. Oh, wow. It's up right. his nose already. Oh. We're going to knock it down where it belongs. Oh, oh why don't you oh, shut up, Harry? It's bats, blades, and chains. When all your worst plans are made, you best sign up for Medicaid. <laughs> <laughs> you better forget about Medicaid. And start saving for your tomb. Oh, you you know. This God of yours, Preach. Is he on my side, too? What's he gonna do for me? I'm a mainliner. You know, the hard stuff. A whole mountain of snow white. That's heaven. You just don't know what heaven's like, Preet. What do you got for me? Huh? I, I don't have any magic cure. Then what did you come here for?
David. We have all been praying for you. We have? This is the preacher in the newspaper. This is David Wilkerson. I am Hector Gomez. I am pastor here. We have been practicing for the service. And this is my wife, Graciela. This is Isaac, Ruth, Israel, Samuel. Go on. Go on, speak to Paris. Shake his hand. Hello. Oh, we are so glad to see you here. So, so where are you staying? Uh, well, it took all the bread money of my congregation to get me here. The cat sleep in his car. Oh, no, you mustn't do that. That is very dangerous. You must come and stay with us, Mr. Wilkerson. Yes. Oh, no, 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 I... I... Oh, it would be awfully nice on my back. It'd be nice to be near a phone, too. I, uh, I'm having a baby. Uh, my wife's having a baby. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, are you are living in the city? This is your home. Thank you. Where do you live? Oh, he's got his car parked in my parlor. You don't have a home. Yeah, I got a home. And I got ten brothers and sisters. Better in the street, more room, and a lot more quieter. So you will live with us, too. <laughs> what is it? What miracle brings such a... such a fine young man to our troubled streets? Miracle? I was beginning to think it was pure insanity. But you people... You, you make me feel that maybe it was... Something good. <laughs> oh.
Mama. Nikki. Yeah, yeah. It does. Back here. Ah. How'd it go? Great, Russick went great. We burned them good. Did you get hurt? Nah, we're doing great. We don't get hurt, baby. We hurt them. <laughs> hey, anybody else been here? Just Mingo. Cheerleader. Would the eyes be coming soon? If they make it. You got your watch? Yeah. Okay. Listen, you give them one more hour, see? No more. Anybody come in that time, you give them their rags and you tell them where the hideout is. Okay, I dig. When the hour's up, you stash the rest of the rags and split. Okay. Ah! What do you think you're doing? I'm gonna preach. You're not preaching here, we got enough trouble. Okay, everybody, the circus over. You can all go home now. Go on. Officer, don't I have a constitutional right to speak on any street corner in America? Only under an American flag. Okay, you people move out. You're blocking traffic. Come on now. Does anybody have an American flag? I can't speak without a flag. You get out of here, buddy, or I'll run you in. That's no flag. You can't speak under that. What do you mean that ain't a flag? What is it then? That's a toy. Get out from there. What's going on? Oh, hello, Sergeant. This fellow's trying to make a speech and he's pawning off that toy as a flag. What's your bitch? I just want to tell these people that somebody loves them. Well, that'll be a novel experience for him. What? That's... That's no flag. That's a toy. It looks like a flag to me. Go ahead. You talk to him. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm just a country preacher, 300 miles from home. But I've got a message for you. Hey, I got a message for you. <laughs> Is there anything in your life you'd like changed? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to make the rich poor and me rich. <laughs> yeah, we got no love, we got no bread. We try to call the law, but the lie was in. Look at that. Hey, man. That's their president. And he's all alone. Cool it, man, look. What's the matter, Preach? You forget your line? <laughs> I don't know much of what's going on around here, but I do know that some of you are, are so blind that you're heading for a ditch and you don't even know it. I've seen you walk around like you own the world. You don't even know how much danger you're really in. Now, you can't live too long around here on luck because somebody can put a knife in your back in the next minute. In fact, for some of you, time may be running out right now. The Bible says, how can you escape if you neglect your soul? Now, that's one thing you can't run away from. Come on, let's go. No, wait a second. I see the hate sticking out of your eyes, some of you. I don't know who put it there, but I do know who can take it out. Some of you are strutting like a big man. But it's all a front. I can see right through you. Come on. You want to go? Go. I want to listen a minute. You pretend that you don't want anybody to touch you. But inside, you're crying out for love. Now, I know there's some pretty tough guys in this crowd. You wouldn't be afraid to shake hands with a skinny preacher, would you? Will you, big cat? What do you want me to do, man? Pray with me.
pray with me right now that the Holy Spirit will come into your heart and make you a new man. I ain't ready, man. Hey, don't let it bug you. You're coming through. Come near me, I'll kill you. Yeah, you can do that. You can cut me up into a thousand pieces and lay them in the street. And every piece will still love you. Sergeant Delano. Why glad to meet you. We burned them. Did we ever burn them? You should have seen them when they hit the trees. They were tripping over wires and knocking each other down like ten pins. And then. Then, when they trapped us in the alley, and they were blasting us with fire bombs, I picked up this garbage can, see? And I was running up the fire escape with great bombs and... Hey, Vicky. Hey, I thought you got busted. I didn't see you get out of the alley. Next time, look over your shoulder when you run. Hey, man, you're kidding, right? I fought out there like a maniac. I don't see a scratch on you. Oh, you're kidding, man. Look at this. Look, look, look at that. Look at that. You got that falling over a garbage can. Are you calling me a liar? I'm calling you a liar and a chicken. Line up. Come on, get off your butts. Let's go. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's go. Now get your belts and leave room to swing. Nikki, honest. Now, you gonna run through, or do I have to come over there and drag you? You hold an election? Mingo is chicken! Israel, I swear, I fought the biggest, blackest jigs you ever saw. Three of them! With back bayonets! What are you trying to do behind my back, make an ass out of me? You've done that pretty good already. When? Hanging around a funny preacher! Keep your voice down! Did you get down on your knees and sing hallelujah? We rapped for a while. Uh, about what? How to bring all your lost sheep into the fold? Why do you let that guy bug you? Because I hate him. He's just a nice guy with a lot of guts trying to help people. He wants to break up the gangs. What the hell do you think he's in the neighborhood for? To be our chaplain? He wants to bless us? <laughs> What's the matter with me? Because you're the worst, craziest bastard there is. If he could reach you, he could reach anybody. Thank <laughs> you.
Hi, Nick. Can I come in? <laughs> you gotta be kidding! I just had to come by and try to make you understand that God loves you. You woke me up to tell me that? Can we talk a while? Listen, you crazy witch. I told you to stay away from me! I didn't think you really meant that. Tell me what I meant. I'll kill you. I'm not afraid of you, Nikki. You better be. You talk tough. But inside, you're just like all the rest of us. You're scared. <laughs> there are a lot of guys with scars from Nikki that know different. Aren't you sick of hating people? I like to hurt people. Aren't you lonely, Nick? Don't sit down. I'm meeting someone. Oh, no, I'm not. Well, I'll just sit till she comes, then I'll split. Hi, the Rumble Girl, huh? Great. And how have you been? Great. I've been just great. Do you think you could let me have some money? Ten bucks. Come on, baby. It's not for stuff. It's for food. Order a soda. I'll pay for it. Don't tease me, Nicky. Then don't try to kid the kidder, baby. I can see that look in your eyes. You're sweating out your next fix. Ten bucks. Trust me, Nicky, just until tomorrow. I wouldn't trust you to yesterday. Remember when you used to do everything for me? I've got a secret. I know a Deb is supposed to belong to the whole gang. But I only really ever belong to you, Nick. Now it isn't a secret anymore, is it, baby? With all the other guys. Boring. But with you, Nick, I really dug it. Write it in my yearbook. I loved you, Nicky. And I was good for you. Now you love the needle. And you're good for nothing. Please, Nicky. Please what? Give me the money. You're really desperate, huh? Like I'm down. You 
know what I mean? You want me to straighten you, huh? What do you think of the preacher? Okay, he wants to help. No, he wants to break up the gang. Do we want to do that? Because he's a fanatic. He's got a one-track mind. He's got to convert everybody. And where does that leave you, huh? Without any gangs to mooch from, you have to hoo for your habit. Just think how boring that would be. What do you want me to do? I want you to get rid of the preacher. How? However, kill him, scare him, ball him, I don't care. Nicky, no! With him out of the way, you have nothing to worry about. I'll see to it. Nicky, you're, you're teasing me. You can have all the junk you ever want. And you can even be my girl again. Nicky, what a mess we're in. Gonna do it? Yeah, but stay in me first. Uh-uh. Do the job first. Then I'll straighten you. I can't. I need to get fixed. I'm shaking so I can't even hold a knife. Is worth. A few bucks. You should have clobbered the guy and searched the whole pad. I bet he had tons of bread hidden in them closets and the shoes. Oh, in his jamaka. <laughs> hey, look at this. It was in his jewel box. The guy's a Catholic. It's worth anything? We gotta take it back. Take it back? It's bad luck to steal a crucifix. Yeah, because you can't get nothing for it. You shut your mouth. Maybe we can take it to the hospital. Give it to Mingo. Are you crazy? He don't even see us. How's he gonna see this thing? He can feel what it is. He don't feel nothing. Yeah, that's right. He's still in a... A coma? A kimono? Mingo's in a kimono. Hey, it's real! Mingo's in a kimono! <laughs> what? Somebody's in the club room. I'll go. It's Nicky. What's he doing? Well, how should I know? What am I, his mother? What do you call these? Tush donuts. Mmm, these are delicious. We don't have anything like this in Phillipsburg. Maybe we should open a mission there. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, David, you have done wonders already. The kids in the street. You've been working with a bad bunch of apples and you've got them smiling. I didn't see Nicky smiling. Nicky! Do you know what you're dealing with when you deal with Nikki? Yeah, but none of them are breaking. I'm just at the point where I think I'm really getting through. They, they turn me off. They turn you off because they're afraid of being called chicken. Being a gang, fighting, stealing, shooting dope is their way of proving that they are a man. Yeah. Maybe if I could just get them all together in one big place. Get them to really commit themselves right in front of their friends couldn't turn back. You mean like a rally? Yeah, a rally. A gang rally with all the beboppers and jitterbuggers and everybody. Now, wait a minute. You can't tackle a horde of the toughest gangs in New York with a Bible. They're liable to crucify you. Where could we get a hall? I think you just lost an argument. What kind of a hall? A big one, big enough for every gang member and junkie in New York. Now, don't take a hall. Take the Grand Canyon. Well, I could get you a hall. Would it be expensive? Never mind about that. If you're crazy enough to go in with those fuzzy face killers, I'll find somebody crazy enough to pay the bill. What's the matter? Nothing. 
Felt like being by myself. Bugged about Mingo, eh? Yeah, I know. It gets to me, too. I just want to know one thing. How can you take a guy like that? A guy like what? What do you mean, Mingo? I mean the preacher. Are you still thinking about him? What'd you rap about that was so interesting? When? The other day by the school. How do I know? I don't even remember. Oh, God loves me crap like that. <laughs> you know, he came to my place at 3 o'clock in the morning just to tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> if he wasn't right on my doorstep, I'd have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what I'd done? I sent Rose over to kill him. <laughs> I gave her the knife and everything. <laughs> no kid. Hey, you think she done it? If she did, it'd be the first thing she done right since she'd been on this stuff. <laughs> I'll get Vacation time's the best time. You know, some of these kids do go to school. No Thanksgiving vacation would be the time. That's right. You know, we're going to have to get a bus to move these guys. They're not going to cross each other's turf. Hello? Hadn't thought about that. David? For me? Thank you. Hello? Hi, Gwen. It's my wife. Rosa. Come in, come in. Is the preacher in? What is the matter with you? Oh, what's the matter? You've seen it before. I'm sorry. You got ten bucks? You know the answer to that. You've asked before. We're here with the Gomezes and Sergeant Delano. I had a wonderful meal. Listen, honey, we've had a great idea. We're going to have a big rally. A lot of the gangs are going to be there. Hector! Oh, Russia! Poor baby! Where's the preacher? Why do you want to see David? Honey, it has to be vacation time. It's the only time we can get the gangs out. What? I want to see you. Please, I got to see you now. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, Gwen, I know it's, it's time for the baby, but aren't babies usually late? Please. Sit down. Would you like something to eat? No. Oh. Uh, Gwen, honey, can I, can I call you back in just a few minutes? I, I've got an emergency here. Oh, honey, it'll be soon, I, I promise. Bye. I, I love... I want to see you, preacher. I've got to talk to you alone. Use a chapel. Who was that? It was a girl in the neighborhood. She's on heroin. Glad to see you again, Rosa. Glad? Oh, sure. Why? Sit down. Why are you glad to see me? Because I've thought a lot about you since the last time we met. You know I love Nicky, don't you? No, I didn't know that. He's like it for me. Now he don't give two props what happens to me. You know why? I think I do, but you tell me. Because you're trying to break up the gang. Break up the gangs? I'm trying to grab them with something that'll wake them up. You don't kill me, or do you? Take it easy, Rosa. Liar! Send me ten bucks. Don't touch me! 
I don't have ten bucks to lend you. I need a fix. Oh, can't you understand that? A fix! I need it twice a day. And I haven't had any since last night. Now give me some bread, man. I got a score. Rosa, I, I'm no easy touch. I'm a man of God. I'm not going to help you kill yourself. You're a filthy thing. That's what you are. You want to scare people into believing in God. So what am I going to do without Nikki? But you didn't think about that, did you? Rosa, if you really want Nikki, you better get yourself clean. I want ten bucks. And you're going to give it to me. Or I'll cut it out of you. Rosa, you don't need that. Rosa? Help! Don't come near me! Help! Please, trying to. Don't. I'm going to stick myself like a pig, and you're all going to watch. Don't throw your life away, Rosa. You're too young. God needs you. He sent you here for help. God wants David to help. your mind. Hey, look at that.
I wish she was in that box instead of Mingo. Yeah, poor Mingo. Boy, that mother's really got guts. Nikki, what's the matter? You get hurt? Hey, Nikki, it's me, little Bo. I sometimes run for your cat. Want me to get help or something? Doctor.
Get away from me. Bo said you wanted to see me. You had of your mind. Mickey, I've got to say two things to you. Yeah. Jesus loves me and you love me. I heard it before. This is important. <laughs> hey, man. No kidding. Look, I got a leak in my chest and my head is busted. Go away, huh? Can't you give a poor speaker a break? Can't you see I'm dying? How can I just walk away and leave you? With your feet. Just leave, man. Tip. Blow. Someday you're gonna stop running, Nikki. When you do, I'll be there waiting. Should I help him? He won't listen to me. Yeah, go ahead. Tag along, Bo. I can do it alone, Bo. I don't mind helping. Go away, please! using this stuff that... Stop. What do you mean, stop? Nobody stops. I know, but I did. Oh, Nick. Look at me. I kicked. It was the preacher in the Gomez family. Get out of here. Is it because of the preacher? Get out of here. All right, I'll go. But just tell me, is it because of the preacher? The preacher, the preacher. All I ever hear on the stuff. All I ever see. Speak. Child, show us your great learning. Mama. You have nothing to fear but God's wrath, my little one. So speak. Our father. Yes. There is more. Our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone else in the day. Enough! I most solemnly forbid you, child, ever again to speak the creed, the Lord's Prayer, or the Ten Commandments in English. We need hear no more. The men will burn. But of our great compassion and mercy, the widow will be spared to provide for this brood after we have taught them afresh the godly ways of the church. See, she is safe home, Morton. Take the rest away. <laughs>
where have you been this late? Forgive me, Lady Anne. There's nothing to forgive, but you have a visitor. For me? Come and see for yourself. He will be dining with us, and from the look of him, I would say his appetite is dulled only by his eagerness to see you. A friend? That I will tell you in no more. Are you familiar with the name Thomas Point? No, sir. Merchant in London. Kinsman to my wife. Cousin or some such. Now, he is a man of your persuasion. Talks endlessly of Erasmus and Luther and the new learning, as he calls it. London is some miles from Cambridge, Sir John. I know that. But the world grows smaller with the passing of the days. And the world of learning grows larger within it. Why, well, even here in the Cotswolds... John! Sure. William! <laughs> at last! Indeed, at last! A man could die for want of nourishment. Lady Anne says that you will stay to dine. Not to dine only, but also to lodge a night or two? Say you will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> but, sire, I said, your horse is the largest in all England. <laughs> if Hannibal had owned such mounts, he would have taken Rome. <laughs> oh, to me it was a jest, but to the king, a challenge. Very well then, sir, he bellowed. We will change mounts and race again. And did you? Aye, I must obey the king. But there's the rub. Though it were politic to lose, ought I to lose on the fastest, finest horse in all England? What say you? If you win, you injure the king. If you lose, you injure his horse. And surely it were better to lose. <laughs> well, we raced and I won. And the king clapped me on the shoulder and said, you will be my champion. Though the king were but 17 years of age. And I but 22 and half as strong as he. <laughs> what would you have done, William? Lost or won? But neither one nor the other. Between me and a horse, I like a large cart or a long distance. <laughs> He is a good and kind man. But his children have no need of a tutor. Perhaps in years to come, but now. So, what would you have me do? Return with me. You have much to give, encouragement to offer. You have faith and wisdom. Why would you rob us of that? Why rob yourself of the fellowship? And the wheelwright, the blacksmith, the plowman? Are they better robbed? What of this man here? Where will he find Christ? Will the priest show him? Or the friars? They are as lost as he, praying to the saints with words beyond their understanding. So you will remain here on the edge of the world to teach the plowman. Moses was 40 long years in the wilderness before he knew what God would have him do. Before I would teach his word, I must learn it. And then? It was in the language of Israel that the Psalms were sung in the temple of Jehovah. Why should the gospel speak to England in Latin, the language of ancient Rome? I shall bring the scriptures to England for Englishmen to read. And the Lord God spoke through his prophet Jeremiah and said that a horrible thing had happened in the land. The prophets prophesied lies, he said, and the priests rule by their own authority. And this was Israel. God's chosen people plucked from the bondage of Egypt and brought to the promised land. The priests ruled by their own authority. And what can we say of England now? What can we say of our coarse monks, our greedy priests and our pompous prelates? Theirs is not the gospel of Christ, but a trade, and a profitable trade at that. Think of it, they want money for everything. They want money for baptisms, money for churchings, money for weddings, for buryings, for penances, for soul masses, for chalices, bells. Those are for the glory of God. Would you so cheapen salvation as to offer it without a sacrifice? As the psalmist declared, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Would this man mock me before this crowd? You poor sheep. The parson shears, the vicar shaves, the priest scrapes, the friar pears. All we lack is a butcher to tear off the skin. Why are the prelates dressed in red? Hmm? It is meant to show that they are ready every hour to suffer martyrdom for the testimony of God's word, for God's word. If any man here so much as utter one question concerning God's word, 
They are ready every hour to burn him. He must be stopped. Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, when I will bring a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They are looking to trap you, William, and they shall. You must take care. Yes. People have been burned, William. Simple, good, honest folk burned. And for what? For teaching their children the Lord's Prayer in English. Does it not trouble you? They shall have a better resurrection. They taught their children the Lord's Prayer and were burned. You would give the nation the whole scripture. What will they do to you? Do you have no fear? Yes. And I must fear him who has the power to destroy the soul. Nothing I say will change you. I would ask only that you walk carefully. Okay, Ross. The first one. The beginning one, the one who makes it begin. The beginner. The beginner and finisher of our faith. <laughs> if I say beginner and finisher, the reader will believe there is an ending of our faith. When of our faith, there is no ending. Teleotes is one who completes, but not one who ends. Teleotes is a fine craftsman who completes his work. A poet, perhaps, who, having brought his art into being, now brings a perfect finish to it. And Archegos, the beginning one, the creator, the author, the author and finisher of our faith. Let us run with patience unto the battle that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. William, forgive me, I startled you. You seem troubled. I have a letter for you. It carries the seal of the archdeacon. Bad news? I would think so. For some time now, there's been criticism of you amongst the priests and friars. I fear what John Bell will have to say. Uh, let us read it and learn what we have to fear. I'm summoned to appear before the archdeacon to answer a charge of heresy. How will you answer? Mr. Tyndale, you have been accused of heresy. In argument, in logic, and in divinity. And I will answer the charges if you can bring just one witness to show where I have erred. I will testify that you did spread out the scriptures nakedly before the people. And I will answer that I did expound the word of God that they might find Christ. The word of God? Why, even we are unable to explain it. How then can the common people? It is a mystery only to those who read it without Christ. That is why it is an obscure book to you. Nothing is obscure to us. It is we who explain the scriptures to you. Then you are wasting both your time and your trouble. Far from explaining the scriptures, it is you who have hidden them. You who burn those who would teach them. Why, if you could, you would burn the very word of God itself. Enough, please. We are not here to debate. Mr. Tyndale, it is written in the scriptures that the people should be subject to the rulers and authorities and should obey the magistrates. What you are doing is outside the law of England. If you deny that law, it follows that you deny the scriptures. I would therefore ask first, if you offend the law, can any good come of it? However well you mean. And secondly, I would counsel that though he have friends in high places, even Sir John Walsh is not above the law. And thirdly, I would charge you most solemnly that when you go from this place, you will obey the law and speak no more heresy. Now go.
You pray to the saints. You make images of them. You light candles to them. If these images can see and hear, perhaps they hunger also. Ah. If they hunger, why do you not make their bellies hollow and put food and drink inside? Jest is ill becoming in one so young. His mind is full of invention. And profanity. Would you make a mockery of sacred images? No more would I than did the prophet Isaiah. He wrote of a man who cut down a tree to light a fire to bake some bread. And when he was warmed and filled, he took the remains of that wood and carved an image. Then he fell down before it and worshipped it, saying, You are my God, deliver me. Did Isaiah laugh when he wrote that? Did Isaiah write that? You are a priest, tutored in the classics in Cambridge University. If you, learned as we suppose you are, schooled in Greek and Latin and divinity, practiced in the arts of debate and contention, if you cannot understand Isaiah or the scriptures you so imprudently expound, how then can the ignorant laity, the blacksmith, the weaver, the plowboy, those who count upon their fingers and look to us to guide them? Uh, one moment, Doctor. As our Lord said, Hotan de elthe kainos top pneumates ale. Ah, spare us, spare us. I acknowledge your learning. Must you parade it before us? I thought perhaps translation might cause offence. Your very presence at this table causes offence, which we endure for the sake of our host and our gracious hostess. If our Lord spoke, would it not be better to hear it in English? Would that all England could hear it in English. Damn your impertinence! What did he say? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. That, young Tyndale, is what the spirit does through the church. But the church has so many persuasions. One man follows Duns Scotius, another Thomas Aquinas, another Bonadventure. If all these learned men are in contradiction one with each other, how can we know right from wrong but by God's word? God's word says, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Give the scriptures to ignorant men, and they'll soon be tearing out their own eyes. Hither and yon will be a nation of blind men. Without God's word, we are a nation of blind men. But without the help of doctors, God's word is too hard to understand. And that is to measure the yardstick by the cloth. There are as many doctors as there are pieces of cloth, but only one yardstick of scripture. By what should we measure that? By the Pope. The Pope whom God has set on earth in direct succession from the Apostle Peter. The Pope through whom God administers truth and justice. The Pope! The Pope! And what if the Pope is at variance with God's laws? Then it were better to do without God's laws than the Pope's. Well, young sir, what do you say to that? I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spares my life, I will see to it that a plowboy shall know more of the scriptures than you do. Forgive me, Lady Anne. I will not sit at table with blasphemers and heretics. No more shall I. No, please wait. I will not spoil the meal. I shall go to my room. You will stay where you are. I will conduct you to my door. Your hospitality is renowned. Your table unsurpassed, and we thank you for your kindness. Take heed, young man. There are fires on earth, and there are fires in hell. Take care that the one is not needful to spare you the other. Forgive me, Lady Anne. Oh, William. What can I say? If your life were not so above reproach, it would be easy. No man's life is above reproach. But I'm afraid. Afraid for you, for myself, my children. Is your position not secure? John is a friend of the king. At his coronation, he was his champion. But the king is ruled by many things. His counsel, his chancellor, his passions, the sight of his face in the looking glass, Nobody is secure. Well done, young William. We are well rid of them. 
It was not my intention to... Don't tarnish it by telling me what your intentions were. You have more learning in your little finger than all those doctors could ever hope for. I was much amused. But the fox is now among the chickens, and soon the feathers will fly. They will not forgive you, and I cannot promise you protection. So, would you have me leave? No, no, no. If you can defy the Pope himself, I can defy a few untutored clerics. If your God would have you stay, then I'll not bid you leave. <laughs> How can I help you, young William? What troubles you? The scriptures speak with one voice, but older men than I, and wiser, seem to speak with another. Then they are surely wrong. But make no mistake, not all within the church are wrong. England has its witness. I wish that England had the scriptures. Then do it. It is within your gift. Within my gift? Yet without the law. Unless you have the authority of a bishop. Well, what bishop in England would defy the authority of the Pope? There is none. But one at least is known to have befriended Erasmus. Cuthbert Tunstall. Go to the Bishop of London. If God will have you prosper, then you will prosper. But take care what you say. He has a broad mind, but others have not. If it is seen that you are of evangelical persuasion, it cost you dear. This is a letter of introduction to Sir Henry Guilford, controller of the King's household. Do you wish to meet Bishop Tunstall? Sir John, I wish for nothing more. If he will only see me and grant me license. See you, he will. But Sir Henry cannot move the bishop's mind. You must do that. Thank you, Sir John. This is the address of my cousin Thomas Points. His house is small, but you will be very welcome until you find accommodation. In the bishop's palace, perhaps. <laughs> you are very kind. You've brought joy to our house for the past two years. Now it will seem very empty. God be with you, William. William, may I introduce Humphrey Monmouth? Humphrey is a merchant and scripture man. William was tutored to my cousin's children in Gloucestershire. Your good name has gone before you. Where are you lodging? Uh, with Thomas and his wife, until I can find a room. Then you need look no further. My house is large. Any man who preaches as well as you is welcome in it. We are many, but careful. That man there, what do you see? A man with the strength of an ox. And the faith of a little child. Harry! Thomas talks of your purposes. Of your learning in Greek. That you would give the scriptures to Englishmen. If God wills. Would God will that his word be not read? <laughs> Whitcliffe translated the scriptures, but few in England have them. Perhaps God would have us hunger for his word before he feeds us. The people are hungry now. Look. Luther. It is good. It is precious. And the word is in it. But it is not the word. Too many books come to England, like this. Secretly, I, by the score. But I say again, we are careful. Men have burned for less. Message, sir. 
William, it has come. Word from Tunstall. The bishop will see you tomorrow. Oh, thank God. <laughs> Perhaps you're right, Humphrey. Perhaps now the people are hungry enough. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, Tyndale, come in, come in. Sit down. Thank you, Your Grace. Sir Harry Guilford has shown me this. An oration of Isocrates translated from Greek to Latin. It is yours? It is, Your Grace. It speaks well of your learning, as indeed Sir Harry speaks well of your conversation and godly manner. What do you require of me? I would enter your employ. As chaplain, Your Grace. And pass your time in scholarly pursuits and classical translations. You have a gift for language, I cannot deny. What, uh, may I ask, commends me to you? Erasmus speaks of you as the first Englishman in Greek and Latin. It was through the Greek Testament of Erasmus that I found Christ. Then Erasmus should be commended. Tell me. If you were to be found in my employ, what work of translation would you undertake? That of, <laughs> that of the Testament, Your Grace, from Greek to English. And for that, you would require my patronage, my Episcopal authority. Yes, Your Grace. Yes. Hmm. A worthy work. Not every priest has the same gift for language as you and I. And most would profit from an understanding of the scriptures. I would wish that the testament be read by everyone, and not by the clergy only. In time, perhaps. In time. Uh, consider the seasons, young Tyndale. How they change. Winter turns into summer slowly through the many shades of spring. The people are hungry for the word of truth now. That same word of truth declares that meat is not for babes, but for those who are strong enough to bear it. When the church has grown to manhood, then shall we feed them. But the scripture also urges that we should desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. We do not starve a baby of milk because it cannot eat meat. You argue well, and I agree with much of what you say. Uh, moreover, there are many within the church who would, I believe, welcome a gentle change. But you know, of course, of Wycliffe and his Lollard followers. And you have considered well how the laity took hold of scripture and used it to dishonor the church. Do not hold that the scripture... There was disorder, civil disobedience and godlessness. The apostle said that God's word was quick and powerful. And our Lord himself declared that he had come to bring not peace, but a sword. I'm sorry. My house is full. I have already more people than I can employ. But... However, I'm sure that if you look about London, you will not fail to meet with suitable employment. Ah. Now, here's a question. William? Must work. To what end? I have amused you. You are a mere man. That is good. There have been times when I thought you to be an angel. William, can the Bishop of London stand in the way of God's will? What is God's will? His will is his command. And his command is that we shall preach the gospel of Christ. It avails nothing if the word is offered in a foreign tongue. There are other bishops with authority. Ecclesia. Those who are called out. 
Mm. You have used the word congregation. Yes. But the meaning would signify church. And church would signify the multitude of shaven, shorn and oiled, which we now call the clergy. The word ecclesia. Ecclesia. is common to all the congregation who believe in Christ. Ah, forgive me. Where are you going? To speak with Humphrey. He has made approaches to certain printers. You would print without a license? After Tunstall, there is none who would grant it. Shall a mere license stand in the way of God's will? Grave, William. I passed the day talking to printers. Every man in London who prints. I've been a nuisance to all of them. Are they all without faith? By no means. Some are with us. Not a man will print the scriptures without authority. And if there be none in London, there be none in England. Then I shall go to Germany and print it there. If Luther's books can find their way to England, so shall mine. Come, Will, you've read it a dozen times or more. And still I'm not happy. That is because you are of a contentious disposition. And because your translation argues with itself, whilst living most agreeably with the Greek. Come, Peter Quentel is expecting us. How can it live most agreeably with a Greek when to one Greek word you ascribe several English meanings? Why in one place does idu mean behold, and in another it means lo? And yet again, look or see. What Greek word would you use for behold? Idu. And for lo? Well, idu, but... Uh, would you choose differently for look, with a sense the same? No. Then the translation is sound and the reading of it enriched. If we are faithful to God's word, we have no cause to weary those who would read it. The English have a language which is rich and beautiful and blessed with infinite variety. Why then can we not use it all? Morning, Herr Quentin. If you say so, Mr Tyndale. Though I printed just this morning, that the days are evil, so we should redeem the time. You read my translation. I could scarce print it otherwise. It's an affliction I must bear if I would pursue my trade. Mr. Quentin, every blessing is to you a cause for complaint. Where is your morning's work? Under those sacks there, concealed. If you want your books displayed, you should work in Hamburg, not Cologne. And rob you of good trade? Or Wittenberg. There are many cities in Germany which would welcome your heresies. I stayed nigh over a year in Hamburg, and Wittenberg was where I met my good and faithful friend, William Roy. Good day to you, sir. And the heresy of which you speak is the gospel of Christ. So you say, sir. But I shall trust my priest. He is, like me, a good craftsman who charges little. And Christ is the master craftsman whose work is offered free. Are these now finished? Uh, but not dry, sir. Oh. Hmm. It reads well. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, and yet had no love, I were even as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I could prophesy and understood all secrets and all knowledge, Yea, if I had all faith so that I could move mountains out of their places, and yet had no love, I were nothing. And though I bestowed all my goods to feed the poor, and though I gave my body even that I burned, and yet have no love, it profiteth me nothing. Love suffereth long and is courteous. Love envieth not. Love doth not frowardly 
swelleth not, dealeth not dishonestly, seeketh not her own, is not provoked to anger, thinketh not evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, suffereth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Though the prophesyings fail, other tongues shall cease, or knowledge vanisheth away, yet love falleth never away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophesying is imperfect. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is imperfect shall be done away. When I was a child, I imagined as a child. But as soon as I was a man, I put away all childishness. Now we see in a glass, even in a dark speaking, but then shall we see face to face. Now I know imperfectly, but then shall I know even as I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, and love. Even these three, but the chief of these is love. Senator Rinker, I fled Frankfurt because the heretics there were running wild. Forgive me if I seem a little nervous. Nervous? Of me? <laughs> I have an aged mother and a small niece still in Frankfurt. You need not fear for them. This is Cologne, Herr Cochleus. We have been spared the Lutheran madness. And so long as there's breath in my body, so shall we be. Now tell me, what is this that you have learned? Two Englishmen are here in this city. This is the work on which they are engaged. Fine craftsmanship. What is it? It is a letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I found this sample in the printing works of Peter Quintel. By chance? By chance, I spoke with certain employees of Herr Quintel, and one, with a little too much wine, who was indiscreet. How indiscreet? He said that whether the King and Cardinal of York wish it or not, all England will soon be Lutheran. England? Never! He said that soon, every Englishman will have the scriptures in their native tongue, and they will have them from Cologne. That they will not. Where is this printing works of Peter Quintel? Gone. Away from here. Yeah, what happened? They have found us. Hurry, we must go. Who has found us? Herman Rinker. Then who has betrayed us? It matters not. But, but, but the books, the, the manuscripts, they must go to the printers. I have all we need. Hurry! They are at the very doors. And you do the same with those. And hurry, please. There isn't very much time. There is no time at all here, Quinto. Please, leave everything as it is. So, here, Quinto, who commissioned this, this perfidious work? Herr Quinto, is not the loss of your trade enough? Would you also lose your liberty? Perhaps, perhaps your life. His name is William Tyndale. William Tyndale. of the world's end. And I am not told of it. Why? Is it because I am only the king? 
Is my majesty so light a thing? Who is William Tyndale? Some low-born priest, sir. Ah, and is this the same low-born priest of whom my ambassador to Spain warned me 12 months since? Yes. And is this the same low-born priest who it is said had undertaken to translate the whole of scripture? The same. And where is my command that he be found and stopped? I have men, even now, in France and Germany and Flanders, who have not paused in their search for him without success. He bolds from place to place. Oh, printing the scriptures on the back of a traveling mule, perhaps. Eh, hey, Thomas? Ah! <laughs> it is not a subject for jest, sir. You tell me it is no jest. What blind, half-witted man have you commissioned to make the search? John Hackett. Oh, John Hackett! And where has John Hackett looked? Wherever Tyndale has been sighted or word of him reported. Hamburg, Cologne, Worms, Marburg, even Wittenberg. Wittenberg? Yes! He's in league with Luther. Without question. Then he's indeed a heretic. You will find him and you will burn his books. You will arrest him and bring him to me. Come, Thomas, I want to talk to you. <laughs> the world will take a sign of this home. <laughs> Have you come to play? No, oh, Anne, I have come to talk. You would do better to play. Your brow has a solemn line to it. The world is a solemn place. <laughs> go on, go on. You play. I shall watch and be amused. <laughs> uh, youth and beauty touch me. So much is evident. And her nature, too. A smile, a laughter, <laughs> her innocence. They do nothing for you, Thomas. Were I to let them? I am a married man. And am I not? You seek to reprove me. It is not my place to reprove any, save myself, which I do often. I also, but a shirt of hair would make me itch, and it is hardly seemly for a king to be a scratching. Would you reprove me for my shirt of hair? I merely <laughs> wish you would cease from scratching. It is no more seemly for a privy councillor than it is for a king. <laughs> what, of, what, of, what of this man Tyndale's testament? Is the translation sound? It has errors in it. Mm, Tunstall would say 3,000. How he can tell, I know not. He does not have so many fingers. Oh, the errors are not so many. <laughs> but the book is evil. Evil will come of it. Why? Oh, come, Thomas, you are my friend. I repay your honesty with mine own. In all my ignorance and folly, I cannot see how a mere volume can cause so much hurt. Men will think, having the scriptures, that they have the truth. But this is an illusion. Will you say the scriptures are not truth? Oh, they are, but they're like a chart. And though a man have a seaworthy vessel and a chart in his own tongue, if he does not have a sailor's knowledge to interpret the chart, his vessel is lost. <laughs> Scripture is a weighty matter. Men need the wise counsels of the church to understand it. But you read it, Thomas, in Greek and Latin, which are as familiar to you as English. Do you understand them? In part. In part, in part, but you are Sir Thomas More. If you should only understand in part, where is the man who would understand him full? Perhaps there is no man, but the full body of the church. Oh, well, that's... I have a problem with Catherine, my wife, who can bear me no trial. I have a problem with Anne Boleyn, who can bear me a son and heir to the English throne, but I cannot take her for wife. Well, such matters are not within the compass of my scholarship. And I have a problem with Moses, who wrote in the scripture that if a man should take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing and they should be childless. Well, I took my brother's wife and I am without a son. How would you interpret the scriptures? I am not a theologian. You are a scholar, Thomas, whose learning is second to none. How should I, I, interpret the scriptures? I would counsel you to seek the opinion of learned doctors, even of His Holiness the Pope. The Pope! <laughs> How do you think William Tyndale would answer? Uh, that, sir, uh, you must ask him. Hmm. That is much I would ask him. I want him found. I am a merchant, William. 
My business brings me here. By what good providence should commerce bring you to Marburg? I looked for you and I found you. And if I, it could be that John Hackett and all the King's agents are not far behind. You found me, Humphrey, because you're my friend. And no as such, and because God wills it. But what news do you bring? Good and bad. The New Testament is spread throughout all England. But everywhere it is burned at the express command of Wolsey and the King. In burning it, they are doing only what I expected. So shall they, if they burn me too. If they find you, William, they will burn you too. For men like us, England is not a happy place to be. John Frith, I am unhappy that you of all men should treat me ill. Lord Cardinal, it is I who am brought from a dungeon. Did I treat you ill, or is it the other way about? I set you in my own college here in Oxford to work for the glory of God. And before God and this company, I declare that such is my only goal. If such is your goal, why do you journey down a path that leads to perdition? Luther's heresy. Tyndale's heresy. The New Testament of our Lord Christ is not heresy, my Lord Cardinal. It is a translation unlawfully made by a poor scholar whose heart is far from the grace of God. It is a true translation faithfully made by one of the finest Greek scholars of our age, a man whose heart bears the stamp of Christ himself. <laughs> and this you know. This I know. Then, seeing you know the man so well, perhaps you will persuade him to come before us and answer certain questions. Of his whereabouts I know nothing, other than that he is abroad. John Frith, are you aware that in this realm I am the Pope's representative? That I make all decisions concerning religion as though I were the Pope? I know that God has given us the scriptures. Decide what you will, my lord, but I shall stick with them. Take him away. I'll hear no more of this. Would God that I had my hands on Tyndall's scrawny neck. It is everywhere, from the highest to the lowest. The more we burn, the more they appear. And now this, the obedience of the Christian man. It is a plague and an infection. Yes. So, if fire will not destroy this heresy, then your pen must. Your grace. The law will not permit me to read heresy, much less debate it. Oh, let us not play games, Thomas. You have a license to read whatever you will. Moreover, I myself will pay you 5,000 pounds to make an answer. 5,000 pounds? Why, I could live like a prince for several lifetimes. I shall see to it. No. I shall take up my pen against Tyndale for the glory of God and his church. And I'll not take a penny for it. If you believe the promises, then God's truth justifies you. That is, forgives your sins and seals you with his Holy Spirit. If you have true faith, so will you see the exceeding and infinite love and mercy which God has you. Anne! Come in.
thought she would stay forever. Richard, you must not be here. My mistress and the king is with her. They're gone, they're gone. But they may return, and if they should find Just you... Just one kiss, that's all I ask. But Richard... Just one kiss, and I hold this book to ransom. Give it to me. Just one kiss. The book is Lady Anne. She breaks my heart. Go, hide yourself now. Come, you must help me dress. The king is going to take me riding. John, may God be praised. Come in. Come in. How did you escape? Not escape, brother. We were set at liberty. I, bet Sumner, Radley, others. Set free. Has the good Lord touched the Cardinal's heart? Wolsey, he could no more bear the stench of death. And his cause is delicate enough these days. So I've heard. And too many scholars have already died at his hand, but enough I'm free. God has dealt kindly with me. Tell me news of William. You saw him. Aye. He is well in mind and body. Ah. And filled with the spirit. Though all the continent seems to do him harm. Yes. And the work? Goes well. Soon we shall have the books of Moses, if God wills it. I must go take him. No. Yes, as soon as I'm able. If you found him, then so shall I. But why? There is work yet to be done here. None that is so important. And what can I do here? I dare not utter a single word. You must be careful, aye, but... Careful? Men, women, children, all, from the highest to the lowest, are arrested and burned for reading and believing the truth, much less for uttering it. must examine the teachings of the church by scripture but understand the scripture by means of what the church says you ask if the air gives light to the sun or the sun to the air is the gospel before the church or the church before the gospel is the church before the gospel or the gospel before the church. I tell you, the Romish church from which the Lutherans came out was before them and therefore is the right one. Who are you? What do you want? Letters and books have you lately received from abroad? Lately? None. Very well. What aid have you given to any persons living on the continent? None for more than three years. William Tyndale abode with me six months. His life was what a good priest should be. I gave him ten pounds when he left, but nothing since. Where is Tyndale now? I do not know. In the course of trade, I met him once in Marburg some months since, but he departed then soon after. So you have news of him? Only that he was shipwrecked and all his works were lost. Where he is now, I cannot tell. And Miles Coverdale? Is it not true that even now, Coverdale is somewhere collaborating with Tyndale in translating the books of Moses? I know nothing of Coverdale. If what you say is true, then you are better informed than I. 
And what of these? They have been openly on my table for more than two years. I've never heard that any priest or friar or layman learnt any great error from them. You cannot put a dry stick in the fire without its burning. Nor can you nourish a snake in your vest without its biting you. You stand accused of having maintained those who are translating the scriptures into English, of having bought Martin Luther's tracts, of having imported them into the kingdom, and lastly, of having said that faith alone is sufficient to save a man. What is your defense and plea? None of this will I deny. I have no defense. But I will plead. I am a merchant. What will become of my workmen if I am cast into prison or burnt? They must have money every week, and who is to pay them? Also consider that my trade brings in large sums to His Majesty's customs. If I am not here, that commerce will stop. Set him free. Tread carefully, merchant. Apostles taught by mouth many of the things they did not write in order that they should not come into the hands of the mocking heathen. You ask whence comes penance, praying to saints, purgatory. I marvel that you should deny purgatory, Mr. Tyndale, except it be a plain point that you go straight to hell. And you say you love, Miss Boyd. I do indeed, my lord. Then let it be said, her love for you, together with my love for the Lady Anne, have conspired to save you. For if petition from each had not come before me, you would be nothing but kindling for Wolsey's fires. I'm most humbly and deeply grateful, my lord. And so you should be. Now go. Yes, sir. And read no more heresies. My lord. So then, what is the volume that so nearly cost a boy's life? This, my lord. Mm -hmm. Read some to me. Kings must make account of their doings only to God. Mm -hmm. No person can be exempt from this ordinance of God. Neither can the profession of monks and friars or anything that the popes and bishops can lay for themselves, accept them from the sword of the king if they break the laws. For it is written, let every soul submit himself unto the authority of the higher powers. Excellent. This is truly a book for kings to read, and for me particularly. Now, who wrote this? William Tyndale. Then I shall read it, and we will talk some more. Tyndale. Would that he were by my side in these times. He must be found. Stephen Vaughan. Yes, and you carry letters from the King of England. Who are you? 
I have been sent by someone who calls himself a friend of yours. Someone who desires very much to speak with you. Who is this friend? Where is he? I do not know him. But if you come with me, you will see for yourself. Why should I trust you? Why should you not? Why should I deceive you? That is a question I should ask. Your friend says that you have been here in Antwerp four long months and accomplished nothing. How does he know this? He has many friends here in the city. He asked me to tell you that you can stay for another four and twenty, except that you follow me. I have no pay for my ale. It will be done. Do not know who I am. I am William Tyndale. The king would have you return to England. The king does not know what he asks. I can offer only the word of God, small comfort to a man who would put away his wife, whether he be king or commoner. But his quarrel with Rome... It's not my quarrel. But if you have a common enemy, what does it matter if you have not a common cause, so long as that enemy is vanquished? The king's mind is for Rome. His heart is for Anne Boleyn. His quarrel is with himself. For me, heart and mind. I must care only for the word of God. Then use the occasion for the word of God. Come to England. I want his majesty of the subtle ways of the clergy. I am a loyal subject of the king. I want him to know this. Then come to England. Here I suffer hunger, thirst, cold, a bitter absence from my friends, hardship and continual danger. But believe me, these matter nothing to me if I do honor to God, true service to the king, and I'm of good worth to his people. God knows I am not afraid to die. Be with Christ. But how shall my work prosper if I am tied to a stake and burned? You will be safe. Say as much to Wolsey. Wolsey? And Cromwell favours you. And Thomas More is Chancellor. I will gladly lose an arm to gain my neck. Ask what guarantees you will, and the King will grant them. Such promises need not bind him. For the clergy will persuade him that I am an heretic. So you will not return? I would. But I cannot. <laughs> if I am unable to persuade you, why then did you agree to meet me? To protest my loyalty to the king. And to ask you to give him these. That he might read them. The night is drawing in. Soon the city gates will close. We must go our separate ways. Shall we meet again? God be with you. My Lord Secretary Cromwell. Declare unto your majesty what in my poor judgment I think of the man. I do assure your grace that I have never spoken with a man who is more. I don't want to know what he thinks of him, Cromwell. Vaughan thinks too well of him by heart. I have read this all. Tyndale's disputation against my Lord Chancellor. And I tell you this, it's full of lies, sedition, and calumny. Then your majesty has changed his opinion. My majesty has indeed. Listen to this, this report from your agent. This is what Tyndale would say to me, to me.
the king. What impudence the man has. If you would condescend, condescend to permit only a bare text of the scriptures to circulate among the people. I would bind myself never to write again. I would throw myself at your feet, offering my body as a sacrifice, ready to submit, if necessary, to torture and death. Well, at least he knows what he may expect. But much of what Tyndale writes and speaks could work to your advantage. I would beg to remind your majesty that you admired his scholarship and wanted him to return. And now I want him to stay away! He is a perverse and hardened character who cannot be changed. I'm only too happy he's out of England. I shall find another scholar, another hundred, and better ones at that. It is a pity, Your Highness, that John Frith should be among the sectarians. Ah, John Frith. Who on earth is John Frith? He is a man greatly distinguished in sciences and letters. Uh, he too holds certain opinions which may give comfort to your majesty. Mm. I would beg to tell you, Lord Secretary, that Tyndale is no coward. Yes, but, yes, I do not but doubt But when his it. own brother is paraded about face on a horse and branded a heretic by none less than the Lord Chancellor. Yes, yes, that was impolitic. How but... then can I persuade the man that his safe conduct is assured? A problem. Or that a return to England would be to his advantage. Vaughan, listen to me. The king has wearied at Tyndale. He has? He strongly desires the reconciliation of John Frith. Frith? Who, he believes, is not so far advanced as Tyndale in his evil way. Evil? And the king, always full of mercy, is ready to receive him to favour. So try to attract him. Charitably. Politically. Indeed. This is a cause for sadness, Thomas. What does your resignation say to me? But high office demands of a man high counsel, which I cannot give. Nothing more. I think there is more. I think you would tell me you are a man of conscience and cannot serve two masters. Oh, my lord, I rejoice in serving two masters. I serve you as my king, and I serve him who is master of us both. Thomas, Thomas, you cannot agree my divorce from Catherine. And this is how you've chosen to tell me. And how will you spend your time? In disputation and writing? And poverty. And go. Thomas! You're a reproach to me! And would you go to England? Yes. John, there is no man on earth I love so much as you. No one in the Lord who can accomplish so much of what I hope and pray for. And shall I accomplish it here, in a foreign land? Just be happy to accomplish it at all, wherever it may be. Nothing awaits you in England. What awaits me in England is no worse and no less than you have suffered here. You have been hungry, cold, persecuted, shipwrecked even, and with all spent many years away from those you love. What can England do to me that the world hasn't done to you? John, you have a wife here. You have work here. You ask me what England can do, ask those who can answer no more. Ask Blonnie, ask Tewkesbury, ask Bayfield. Yes, and as once you said to me, they will obtain a better resurrection. If God gives me strength, I shan't flinch from the scaffold. William, I go to England not because Henry requires it, but to spread the gospel of Christ. And how will you spread the gospel from a scaffold? How many men will hear you? What good will come of this? I must go up to Jerusalem. As God wills it.
dearly beloved brother, be cold, sober, wise, and circumspect. Keep you low by the ground, avoiding high questions. Expound the law truly, and open the veil of Moses to condemn all flesh and prove all men sinners. Then set a broach the mercy of our Lord Jesus, and let the wounded consciences drink of him. Beloved in my heart, there liveth not one in whom I have so great hope and trust, and in whom my heart rejoiceth, not so much for your learning and whatever gifts you have, as because you walk in those things that the conscience may feel, and not in the imagination of the brain. Do you not hold that the natural body of Christ, his flesh, his blood, his bones, are contained under the sacrament, and are there present without any figure of speech? No. I do not. Cleave fast to the rock of the help of God. Stand fast and commit yourself to God. He is our God, and his is the glory. As the sheep bound by the hand of the butcher, with timid look begs that his blood may soon be shed. Even so do I pray my judges that my blood be shed now. If by my death, the king's eyes should be opened. Dearly beloved, fear not men that threaten, nor trust men that speak fair. Your cause is the gospel of Christ, a light that must be fed with the blood of faith. You are not alone. Follow the example of all your other dear brethren who choose to suffer in hope of a better resurrection. Bear the image of Christ in your mortal body and keep your conscience pure and undefiled. Your wife is well content with the will of God and would not for her sake have the glory of God hindered. As our Lord Jesus wept over Jerusalem, will he now weep over England? Will he weep for those who kill the prophets and burn them which are sent to her? Will he gather the children of England even as a hen gathers her chickens under her wing. I'm not a scholar, William. But it seems to me that in a good family, the children trust their father. Even when they don't understand the wisdom only years can bring. Aye. And sometimes, Mrs. Points, a good mother can say the right word to a faithless child. Who knows even now what the good Lord prepares for his people? You know who I am? Yes, Your Grace, you are Stokesley, Bishop of London. And what do you know of me? <laughs> that you are wise and charitable. Do not and lie I... to me, you know no such thing. Tunstall was wise and charitable, kind and good. I am wise. Charity is something I use sparingly and not on rogues like you. No, Your Grace. Now I shall recount such that I know of you. You are Henry Phillips, thief, liar, a villain, and a reproach to your father. Now, tell me what common ground is there between us? There can be none, Your Grace, between a rogue such as I and your good self. Oh, you fawning, pitiful creature. I shall tell you. What think you of these? The obedience of the Christian man, practice of prelates, parable of the wicked mammon, the New Testament in English. They are to be despised, Your Grace. And their author? He should be put to the flames and burnt. There. We have common ground between us. Tell me. 
Why do you think does William Tyndale yet live and work and infect this happy island with his poison? Because he is crafty and conceals himself well. So then, his capture requires a man of equal craftiness. Yes, Your Grace. Such a man are you. You will find him, arrest him, and bring him to me. But, Your Grace... Or I shall find for you the darkest, coldest, wettest cell in all London, and that is where you will end your days. Yes, Your Grace. Thomas More, how are the mighty fallen? I am as near to heaven here in the tower as I would be in my own home. Thomas, I am your friend, and the king is a good and gracious lord towards you. That has never been in dispute. Then say as much. I have, and do. Thomas. An act of Parliament has proclaimed the King's supremacy. He is the head of the Church. I have not uttered a single word against it. And not a single word for it. Your silence condemns you. That's what they'll say. It's treason, Thomas. If I must die, the executioner will do no more than open the gates of heaven for me. I shall die for my faith in the Catholic Church and as a good servant to God and the King. But to God, first of all. In youth, old days and summer, we rode together as boys, don't you know? But now the summer is over, and I can only look back fondly. You are a rare and true friend, John. So also was Thomas More. John! No, 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 let him be. Prove my point. Who but a true friend could be so bold? None but a friend of one's youth. <laughs> Thomas was a friend indeed. He lost his head. Reasons for state. But I loved him dearly. Tell me. Did not William Tyndale lodge here in years past? Yes, a long time ago. He was tutor to our children. How was he then? How was he? Well, I have read all that he has written. Seems to me such wondrous words speak well of the man who wrote them. Seems to me you are at variance with your master. Oh, she's my wife, damn it! What other than she'd get variance with me? William Tyndale was, and still is, a man of courage, wisdom, and infinite kindness. So I deemed him to be. Is still, you say, you know him still? By report. He lodges with a cousin, Thomas Poynes. You know the place? He lives abroad, we don't know where. My cousin is a merchant, a traveler. He may have shared a lodging at some time of business. Nothing more. <laughs> You know, I often think the crown is heavy when my friends do not trust me. Phillips, sir. Come to acquaint myself to you. Phillips. Phillips. I heard you preach this morning, sir. A word, if I may say, full of truth and power, and much to the glory of Christ. Oh, uh, the word was his own. I was reading from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. But in English. Uh, <laughs> I'm a student at Louvain. There the word is held in contempt. I travel here as often as I can to listen and to learn. Oh, yes, now I recall. Phillips. <laughs> Merchants have spoken of you. Highly. 
and of your interest in the word. Believe me, my brother, I cannot begin to tell of the joy brought by the freedom here. Everyone speaks of Christ without fear. The city profits by the English trade. So therefore we are safe enough and left in peace when close to the merchant's houses. And what of lodgings? Are there any near the merchant's house? William. Thomas. Harry, this is my good and close friend, ah. Thomas Point. And Mrs. Point. Welcome to our home. We've heard much about you. And I have you. You are no less handsome a woman than was assured me by William. Oh, William. Her price is above rubies. Have you been in Antwerp long? Just a short time. I find the city full of English merchants, all followers of the gospel and strong in the word of mm -hmm. God. And such a one is Harry. His outspoken favour of the gospel goes before him, though I fear he is rather more courageous than cautious. <laughs> the truth deserves <coughs> boldness, though it shames me to say so to someone like you. Well, William, these have arrived. Oh. Ah, these volumes. You're familiar with them. <laughs> As with my own face. Though I never thought Providence would favour me with knowing their author. If I may make so bold, I have prepared a meal. If perhaps you'd like to come through? Madam, it is written that angels have appeared in the guise of men. I perceive not men only, but also women. <laughs> William, how well do you know this man? Why do you ask? Well, I, I cannot say he... Can we trust him? Thomas, of course. How can you think ill of him? He seems... He seems a man of quiet manners and godly behaviour. Let's go and dine. Thomas, speak to him tomorrow. Let him earn your confidence. Did you aware to speak of the dangers in Antwerp? <laughs> a man could be drowned and carried away in such a flood. Ah, the rain will stop, believe me. Tomorrow it will be fine. But the enemies of the gospel will still be with us. If you are to return to the city, you'll be advised to take a guide. Return I must. I have several purchases to make. But tell me, you speak of danger. Does Master Tyndale not fear that someone may be bribed? A friend, perhaps? Master Tyndale thinks well of all men. Such thoughts would find no place in him. I have much gold. For what? For my purchases. Good. Our friend is much taken with the city. It is old and there is suffering. And one is always afraid some new plague will appear. But God is here and working out his will. And you also. I should like to come with you to witness your preaching and ministrations. Then come. There is always work. And you, Thomas. Will you also join us? Tomorrow I must sail for London. My business will take me some time. Then it is but you and I, William. <laughs> we shall be about God's work in the morning, and then we shall dine, and at my expense. <laughs> well, if that is your wish. <laughs> it is. Indeed it is. So... One moment. Here, friend. There. It is little enough. What ought to be for one's neighbour, what Christ was to us. <laughs> William! Harry! <laughs> now, we thought we'd lost you. Oh, forgive me. I paused only to purchase this volume. A gift for my tutor. <laughs> <laughs> you seem to know this town better than I do, Harry. Good <laughs> morning. A morning's work done well, and to the glory of God. And by the grace of God. It is he who does the work, if we would but let him. And so we have earned our bread. William, I, I think I've been robbed. Robbed, Harry? Where? Well, I don't know, man. It doesn't matter. I carried only a few shillings. <laughs> Except I was to buy you a meal. Ooh, I have money. I will buy the meal. God forbid. <laughs> it was my invitation. But perhaps you'll lend me the money I've lost. <laughs> yeah. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I will repay you as soon as we return. When you can, Harry. When you can. <laughs> I'm doubly indebted to you, William. <laughs> Run! Harry! Run! Save yourself! Yes. This is the man. Take him away.
What have they done? William! And you, my love, are you harmed? They have taken him. He searched. He took his box. <laughs> I have done what I can. I have written letters. But, Thomas, you have the King's ear. His ear? He says, well, I do not have his gout or his ulcerated leg. His ear, at least, is sound. I do not jest. Nor I. The affairs of church and state alike depend on Henry's mood. And that itself depends on the pain his body brings. But you can speak with him. He once thought very high of Tyndale. He cannot so easily alter his opinion. He cannot. You can ask him. Yes, I can ask him. No! No, no, no! Your Lady Anne required that I should ask. When Lady Anne shall deign to bear a son, then shall I hear her request. Till then, Tyndale can rot, and she can rot with him for all I can. William Tyndale, the King of England has somewhat against you for crimes committed in that realm. These do not concern us. You have been arrested and stand charged with heresy. In that, first, you maintain that faith alone justifies. Second, you maintain that to believe in the forgiveness of sins and to embrace the mercy offered in the gospel is enough for salvation. Third, you aver that the traditions of men cannot bind the soul. Fourth, you affirm that neither the Virgin nor the saints pray for us in their own person. And fifth, you assert that neither the Virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. How do you answer? I answer thus, with a clear conscience before God and man, that I have never maintained, affirmed, averred or asserted anything contrary to the plain meaning of God's holy scriptures. On these alone, and these alone I stand. Would you say then that faith alone justifies and not works? The fruit that grows on a tree does not make the tree good or bad. It only makes known whether the tree is a good tree or a bad tree. And works do not make a man good or bad. They only make it plain to other men whether he who performs those works is good or bad. A man is reconciled before God by faith alone. And works serve only to make this justification known before men. Such is the contention of the Apostle Paul, as it is written. By grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. To the Marquis of Bergen. I believe, right worshipful, that you are not unaware what may have been determined concerning me. Wherefore, I beg your lordship, and that by the Lord Jesus, that if I am to remain here through the winter, you will permit me to be sent from my goods a warmer cap. For I suffer greatly from cold in the head, and am afflicted by perpetual catarrh, which is much increased in this cell. A warmer coat also, and a piece of cloth to patch my leggings. And I asked to be allowed to have a lamp in the evening. 
But most of all, I beg and beseech your clemency that you will permit me to have the Hebrew Bible, Hebrew grammar, and Hebrew dictionary that I may pass my time study. But if any other decision has been taken concerning me to be carried out before the winter, I will be patient, abiding the will of God to the glory of the grace of my Lord Jesus Christ, whose spirit, I pray, may ever direct your heart. Amen. Open the King of England's eyes. When Tyndale died, there were already two Bibles circulating in England. Each effectively contained Tyndale's translation of the New Testament, and much of his work had been used for the Old Testament. When one of them, Coverdale's version, was presented to Henry VIII, he was assured by the bishops that they could find no errors in it. Then, if there be no heresies in it, then in God's name, let it go abroad among the people. The following year, His Majesty authorized a small phrase of immense significance to be added to the title page of the English Bible, set forth with the King's most gracious license. On September the 5th, 1538, Henry ordered every church in England to display one book of the whole Bible of the largest volume in English. The whole Bible, printed in English, was at the heart of the Reformation in England. It remains as a memorial to William Tyndale and an answer to his dying prayer.
And nothing is too good for my little Adelaide, the daughter of the mayor of Friedensdorf. And the richest and the most important man as well. <laughs> oh, well, yes. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Adelaide. Yeah, uh, uh, Pastor, let me give you a hand with that. Uh, oh. oh, thank you. Somehow it seems to get heavier every year. Uh, yes, well, the nativity scene is an important part of our Christmas celebration, and we all must do our part, even the mayor. Papa, let's go! Yes, of course, dear. Sorry, Pastor, that's all the help I can be for now. I have a date with my favorite daughter. I'm your only daughter, Papa. Uh, yes, well, of course, that's right. Care for a paper this evening, Mayor? It's a special edition. Only two days to Christmas, you know. Uh, thank you, Brigetta. Uh, Christmas news is always good news. Uh, keep the change. Why, I thank you, Mayor. Got a bit of the Christmas spirit yourself, I see. <laughs> I suppose I do, Brigetta. <laughs> I suppose I do. <laughs> Come, Father. Uh, yes, yes, of course, dear. Good evening, Carla. Could you use a hand with that? I surely could, Brigetta. The village looks wonderful. Everyone seems to be decorating this year. Everyone except... Lonely Hans, it's the same every year. Good evening, Hans. Christmas is coming soon, or haven't you noticed? <laughs> the quicker it comes, the quicker it can be over and done with. Goodness, Hans, I don't understand why you hate Christmas so much. And I do not understand why you love Christmas so much. So that makes us even. I love everything about it. Lighting the Advent candles, the holiday food, the church celebrations, the joyful Christmas spirit in the village. I even love buying Christmas presents from my family. This year, I'm buying my wife a warm winter coat. And <laughs> my daughter has a list a mile long. Well, I have no family. Don't you have something better to do than to sit around here soaking up all my heat? You do not have to be rude, Hans. I can take a hint. It was not a hint! All right, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. <laughs> and what do you want? Are you here for a Christmas handout, too? <coughs> well, do not bother, Aldo. Christmas is just another excuse to be greedy, and I will not be part of it! <coughs> what? Who is there? Care for a newspaper, Hans? I have one left. Can you not see I have work to do? I do not have time to read a newspaper. The bakery has the most wonderful sweet cakes. You should buy one to serve to your Christmas guests. You know as well as I do that no one ever visits me. Not now, and certainly not at Christmas. Oh, each year I keep hoping things will change for you, Hans. I truly hope you have a Merry Christmas anyway. What do you know? You're just a stupid bird. Now what? What do you want? Is that any way to greet your mayor, Shoemaker? I'm very sorry, Your Honor. I thought you were that old woman. <laughs> what? I did not mean to say that you were an old woman. I mean, you are certainly not old. <laughs> uh, never mind all that. We are here on the most important business. Mr. Mayor, how may I be of service? I am searching for the perfect Christmas gift for my darling Adelaide. I doubt that we will find such a gift here, Papa. <laughs> Nevertheless, we must look at all possibilities. Show us your finest wear, shoemaker. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, but I've not made a new pair of shoes for quite some time. Most of my business is repairing old shoes for the people of the village. Come, Pa. 
Papa. We're wasting our time here. You see, Aldo? Now I have lost a sail. <laughs> you are right, Aldo. I should have offered to make a pair of shoes for the mayor's daughter with that fine red leather I have been saving. But it's too late now. The mayor will find his gift somewhere else. The mayor! He's back! Mr. Mayor, I am so glad you came back. Good evening, Hans. Oh, it is only you, Gretchen. Yes, it is only me. But today I have business for you. What is this? Can you believe it, Hans? Someone threw away these perfectly good shoes. These shoes belong in the trash. They're hopeless. Oh, I was hoping you could work your magic on them. Oh, I want to have them cut down and repaired for my granddaughter, Elsa. They will be her Christmas present. It would take no less than a miracle to repair these shoes. But I can pay. Pay? What can you pay, Gretchen? This is the finest bundle I have. I was saving it for Elsa and myself, but I would like you to have it. Twigs won't buy my supper, you know that? Please, Hans. I know a bundle of twigs is not much payment for your fine work, but it is all I have, and Elsa so needs the shoes. It is for a gift. I was hoping to appeal to your Christmas spirit. Christmas spirit? More like greedy spirit, you mean? Everyone is so worried about Christmas gifts. No one has ever given me a gift, and especially not at Christmas. Hans, I'm surprised at you. Christmas is about more than presents. Not from what I see. Gifts at Christmas are a symbol of the celebration of God's great gift. See? Nothing but gifts. But Hans, God gave us the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, born in Bethlehem to be the savior of the world. Isn't that worth celebrating? Well, yes, but... Well, good night, Hans. Hans? Hans? <gasps> Who are you? What do you want? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. This cannot be happening. Is this... I mean, are you a real... Hans, you can be happy that Christmas is coming this year. Not you too. This must be a nightmare. For on this Christmas, you will receive a special gift. No one would be silly enough to buy me a gift. I hate gifts. This gift will be above all others. It will be a gift from God. A gift from God? To me? Morning, Frederick. Morning, Brigetta. Where do they sell the finest gifts in the village? I must buy a present for someone very special. Well, how about the bookbinder right across the street? Thank you, Brigetta. Wonderful idea. How oh, nice to see you out and about. What can I do for you? I must have the very best gift in your shop, Gustav. Oh, how about this lovely painting? One of a kind, you know. No, no, no. It's nice, but I must have your very best. Oh, this sculpture is perfect. Seems to be real, does it not? No, I think I've seen it somewhere before. Don't you have something different, something beautiful and exciting and, and special? Come, Hans, I have just the thing. But that's just a simple box. Think so? <laughs> Watch this.
It, it, it's amazing. Papa, look! Oh, Mr. Mayor, Adelaide, how lovely to see you. Gustav, what is this? Why, it is... That is my gift, Papa. I want that music box. No, wait, I want to buy it. Here, Gustav, you can have all of my money. Whatever he has, Gustav, I will pay more. But, but... Sorry, Hans. <laughs> oh, Papa! Uh, how about one of these other music boxes, Hans? Uh, this one is nice. You don't understand, Gustav. It must be the very best. I will keep looking. Please, let me help you with that. Gretchen, you like to exchange gifts at Christmas, don't you? Yes, if they are given in the right spirit. Well, what gift would you give to someone very special? Oh, that depends on who it is, Hans. Well, um, it is God, actually. What would you give to God for Christmas? I would give him what I give him every day. My sins for his pardon, my weakness for his strength, my sorrow for his joy. Well, that is not exactly what I had in mind. Think about it, Hans. Ponder it in your heart. You will know what to do. That's it. Thank you, Gretchen. Elsa, you have saved the day. By the way, Merry Christmas! The herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. Among the mercy mild, while the limb and black and smile. Joyful all ye nations cry, join the king among the skies. Aldo, my friend, I was hoping you would come today. Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. You're right, Aldo. It's been too long since I've sung a Christmas song. I'll tell you a little secret. I have forgotten some of the words. <laughs> but at Christmas, who cares? Just as long as we sing. Take a look, my friend. This is the finest leather in the land. I've saved it for many years for just such an occasion. I know it is small, but it is the best. I will make something wonderful with it. Silver nails, all handmade by my father. And these silver bells are from my very first Christmas tree. They make me so happy. I'm making a gift, Aldo, a Christmas gift. I know what you're thinking. But I've been told that this year I will receive a gift, a very special gift, and I must have one just as special to give in return. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how is doing in there. I hear he's making a gift for a king. Oh my, a king? Mm. Ah! Shh, Aldo, I am nearly finished. You are so impatient. Now, they are done. <whistles> They're even better than I'd hoped. I want everyone to see my special gift, the red boots for Christmas. Make way, make way for the mayor. Let me through, please, let me through. Oh, my. Those are the most beautiful boots I've ever seen. That is the gift, Papa. That is what I want for Christmas, the red boots. Uh, yes, of course, dear. Then you shall have them. Shoemaker? Yes, Mayor. How may I help you this fine Christmas Eve? Oh, you are a sly one, Shoemaker. Christmas Eve, indeed. I do not understand, Mr. Mayor. I have not made a new pair of shoes for quite some time, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> you knew I would not find a gift as magnificent as these boots anywhere in Friedensdorf, so you waited until Christmas Eve to get the price up. So, what is your price? I am sorry, Mayor, but these boots are not for sale. They are a gift. Papa! Of course they are a gift. A gift for my Adelaide. Now name your prize. No. 
The boots are not for sale, not at any price. <gasps> I think I left a teapot boiling. This is not over, Shoemaker. I mean to have those boots. I could not give up the red boots, Aldo. They are my gift to God. Not yet, Aldo. These sweet cakes are for my special visitor. I must prepare the very best. I do not think our guest will mind if you have just one little sweet cake. Do you, Aldo? Soon, Aldo. Very soon. It is finally Christmas Eve, and we have everything ready. From God, our heavenly Father, a blessed angel king, and unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the Maybe it's time. Oh, oh, it is only you, Frederick. I'm happy to see you too, Hans. I brought you a present, a Christmas present. Stamps? How useful. Merry Christmas, Hans. You must be freezing. Come in and warm yourself by my fire. I know I was a little gruff with you the other day. I did not mean to be. Oh, my, my. You really have gotten the Christmas spirit, Hans. Well, actually, I'm expecting someone. I brought you a present, Hans. Tomorrow's Christmas newspaper. Now you won't have to go out in the cold to get one. Oh, how nice. Thank you. Oh, I wondered what smelled so delicious. Christmas Eve dinner. I fixed it myself. Please, come in and join us. Here, sit down. Be my guests. <coughs> it is okay, Aldo. We have plenty. Come and join us, Hans. I guess I will. It is still early. My guests should arrive soon. Guest? Who are you waiting for? There he is. Don't go away. You will be amazed. Hans, Merry Christmas. I brought you a present, one of my special calendars. Mayor, uh, uh, thank you, Mayor, but it, it's really not necessary. And about today, I, well, it, see, it's just... You don't have to explain, Hans. I, I know my little Adelaide is a bit spoiled, but what am I to do? She is my only daughter. Uh, all I can offer you is some Christmas Eve dinner. Why, thank you, Hans. I never turn down the gift of a meal. Aren't you going to join us? Someone must say grace, and it is your dinner. When I was a child, we used to sing a special grace at Christmas. From heaven above to earth I come To bring good news to everyone Glad tidings of great joy I bring To all the world and gladly sing To you this night is born a child A merry chosen virgin mild this newborn child of lowly birth shall be the joy of all the earth. Thanks for the wonderful meal, Hans. It was the best I've had in a long time. I would have been too tired to cook after such a hard day. It was truly a special treat. It was delightful, Shoemaker, but I must run. I want to get ready for midnight worship at the church, you know. <laughs> you know, I really enjoyed your company. No, Aldo, I must have missed my special gift. But it was a lovely evening, after all. Hey, Aldo. Oh, it is you again. 
Have you come to tell me more stories? I did not get my special gift as you promised. I had everything ready. I decorated, built a warm fire, and cooked a goose. And I made the red boots especially. Let me help you understand, Hans. Giving gifts at Christmas can be a fine custom, as you have learned from your friends. But the real message of Christmas is God's gift of His Son, born a baby in Bethlehem. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Yes, yes, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I understand now. That is the real gift. Receive such a wonderful gift from God this Christmas, Aldo. This is the least I can do. A blessed Christmas to you, Hans. Thank you. Merry Christmas. But Papa. This is what Christmas is all about, Adelaide. We give to each other because God has given us the greatest gift of all. Savior, which is Christ the Lord. your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will also be with me where I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life.
After thousands of years of preparation, God was about to send the promised Savior Messiah King into the world. But who would he be? And how would he come? You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. If we could travel back through time and space, back, back, way back, before there were people, planets, or stars, we would witness the power and glory behind the first words of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. It was time to prepare the planet for people. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Each day of creation gives us a clue as to what God is like. Day one shows us that God is holy. He is perfect and pure, like light. Day two, God is all-powerful. He made and maintains the atmosphere. Day three, God is good. He created thousands of plants and foods for us. Day four, God is faithful. The sun and the moon stay in their orbits. Day five, God is life. He put fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Day six, God is love. After God created the animals, it was time to form the creatures upon whom he would pour out his love. It was time to create the special beings who could reflect his holiness, power, goodness, faithfulness, life, and love. On the sixth day of creation, the king conversed within himself God, his Holy Spirit, and his word, saying, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over all the earth and over all the creatures. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. The first man and woman were created with the ability to think, love and speak like their creator so that they could enjoy a close relationship with him. After making the first human body from dust and breathing life into it, God planted a garden in Eden somewhere in the Middle East. A crystal clear river flowed through the garden. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Lord God did not ask Adam if he wanted to live in Eden. God was man's creator owner. He knew what was best for man. 
the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. This was not a difficult command. Adam could eat any of the fruits in the garden, except one. By obeying this simple rule, Adam could show that he trusted his Creator to know what was best for him. What did God say would happen to Adam if he broke this rule? Did God tell Adam that if he ate the forbidden fruit, he must begin to do religious rituals, use prayer beads, fast, give alms, go to a church, synagogue, or mosque, and try to do enough good deeds to balance out his bad deeds? Is that what God said? No, that is not what God said. God told Adam, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Disobedience to God's law is called sin. The penalty for breaking God's rule would be death. In his book, the king calls this the law of sin and death. The king's law says that sin must be punished with death. Death means separation. If Adam disobeyed God's one rule, he would become like a broken branch which begins to wither and die the instant it is separated from its source of life. If Adam decided to do what he wanted to do instead of what the king of the universe told him to do, that would be an act of rebellion. That would be sin. Sin would end man's friendship with God. Sin would cause man's body to grow old and die. Sin would separate man's spirit, soul, and body from God forever. Sin is deadly. After God had given the first man a job to do and a rule to obey, it was time to form the first woman. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Like Adam, Eve was created in the image of God. She too was made to know her creator owner, reflect his character, and enjoy a happy relationship with him forever. The Lord God cared for Adam and Eve like a wise and loving father. Each evening, he would come into the garden to walk and talk with them. They were happy and comfortable in his presence. But Satan was not happy. He hated God, and he hated these two creatures who reflected the image of God. So the devil, who had failed to seize the kingdom of heaven, plotted to take over the kingdom of earth. If only he could get Adam, the head of the human race, to choose to break God's law, but he would not tempt Adam directly. One day, Eve heard a voice. It wasn't Adam. It wasn't God. It was a serpent. For Eve, a talking reptile was just another new discovery. She had no idea that God's enemy was using the serpent nor did she know Satan wanted to use her to tempt Adam to break God's law. The serpent had waited patiently, his calculating eyes tracking the woman. Then, at the opportune moment, he hissed out to her, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? Satan wanted Eve to doubt God's word. He also wanted her to think that God was keeping something good from her and her husband. The woman said to the serpent, 
We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Who should Eve trust? Her creator or a creature? When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. She ate it. He ate it. Eve ate the forbidden fruit because she was deceived by Satan's tricks. Adam ate it because he deliberately chose to go his own way instead of God's way. Instead of submitting to their holy and loving creator, mankind had surrendered to the enemy. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked they tried to cover their shame with fig leaves, but no amount of self-effort could fix their problem. They were helpless to get rid of the sin that had invaded their souls. They were helpless to restore the honor they had lost. The first couple had become like a branch broken off a living tree. Their sin had broken off their relationship with the king of the universe. Spiritually, they were dead. Their sin had separated them from the source of eternal life. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? On the same day Adam and Eve sinned, God announced some of the far-reaching consequences of their sin. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve had lost dominion over the earth. Their world would now include thorns, pain, sadness, sickness, and death. Mankind had sinned and mankind must die. The law of sin and death required it. Man had no way to save himself from the curse of sin. Was there any hope? Satan had stolen the king's special treasure, but the king had a secret plan to buy it back. Because the ransom price the king planned to pay would be so unthinkably high, neither demons nor humans would understand his plan until after it was fulfilled. On the same day Satan captured the human race, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This was the first of many prophecies in which God would, little by little, make known his secret plan to rescue people from Satan, sin, and death. But to hide that plan from Satan and his followers, the king put the prophecy in code. God promised to send to earth a savior, the offspring of a woman, the Savior would have a human mother, but no human father. He would be known as the Messiah, meaning the Chosen One. Satan would strike the Messiah's heel, but the Messiah would crush Satan's head. What did all this mean? Later the king would make it clear, but for now, God had given Adam and Eve a ray of hope. Thousands of years later, one of the king's prophets would write, 
The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God is with us. The king would ransom his special treasure. But how much would it cost? Do you remember what Adam and Eve did after they ate the forbidden fruit? They made coverings of fig leaves. Did their coverings make them feel comfortable in the presence of their creator judge? No, they felt ashamed and guilty. They had no way to make themselves right with God. So God did something for them. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Who made the first animal sacrifice ever? God did. Because of what the Lord did for them, Adam and Eve were happy to be with God again. The animal blood covered their sin. Adam and Eve deserved to die that day, but innocent animals had died in their place. The animal skin robes covered their shame. Once again, Adam and Eve felt comfortable to be in the presence of God. Thousands of years later, one of God's prophets wrote, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for He has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. Only God has a way to make sinners right again. Still, sin has consequences. Just as God put Lucifer and his evil angels out of the heavenly paradise, so now God put the man and his wife out of the earthly paradise. After banishing them from the garden, the Lord God stationed mighty angelic beings to the east of Eden, and a flaming sword flashed back and forth, guarding the way to the tree of life. Our great Creator God is holy. This means He is pure, clean, perfect, and righteous. Because of His holy nature and holy laws, He must punish sin with death, separation from the source of life. Some people think that God is so great that He can ignore the laws He Himself has decreed. Imagine a courtroom where the judge refuses to enforce the laws of the land. Would you say that such a judge is great? Imagine a football match where the head referee ignores the rules of the game. Would you call him a great referee or a bad referee? Satan wanted Eve to believe that her creator would not enforce his rules, that he would not punish lawbreakers with death. But the righteous king and judge of the universe always keeps his word. God is great. You can trust Him. Outside the garden, the world was still a beautiful place, but it also included bad things like prickly thorns, pesky bugs, skinned knees, and stuffy noses. Many animals were no longer friendly. Food was not easy to find. Adam and Eve had to work hard just to fill their hungry stomachs. They also had moments of happiness and joy. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Eve named the world's first baby Cain, meaning possession. What a precious treasure from God. Perhaps she thought her son would be the promised savior, but she soon discovered her cute little boy was stubborn and self-centered, just like his parents. Later, when their second son was born, Eve named him Abel, meaning vanity or nothing. Clearly, Adam and Eve could not produce the sinless offspring of a woman who would save people from their sins. Instead of reflecting God's holy image, Adam and Eve's offspring reflected their own sin-bent natures. 
Adam had sons and daughters in his own likeness, in his own image. Do you see Cain grabbing the melon from his little brother? He is acting like his parents, who took the fruit that was not theirs. Like a contagious disease, Adam and Eve's sin had infected their children. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. An African proverb says, a rat can only produce offspring that dig. An Arab proverb voices the same fact. The son of a duck is a floater. When our first parents sinned, they became like a branch broken from a tree. Just as every twig and leaf on the broken branch is affected, so every member of Adam's family branch is affected by Adam's sin. Was there a way for God to pardon Cain and Abel and declare them righteous in his sight? Yes, but it would be very, very costly. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That unbreakable law of the universe, the law of sin and death, must be carried out. Sin must be punished with death. That is why the king's way of forgiveness required a death payment. While the sinner deserved to die, God would accept the blood of certain kinds of animals, such as a lamb. The lamb could not be sick or scratched or dirty. It had to be healthy and clean. It had to be a perfect lamb. The lamb would be killed and burned. It would die in the place of the guilty sinner the lamb would be the sinner's substitute. One day, both brothers brought offerings to God, but only one brought the right offering. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Which offering do you think God accepted? The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Because he trusted in the Lord and his plan, Abel was forgiven and declared righteous. This was God's gift to Abel. God had loaded Abel's sins onto the lamb. The lamb had died in Abel's place God's righteous anger against sin had fallen on the lamb instead of on Abel. Why was God pleased with Abel's sacrificed lamb? Because it pointed to the coming Savior who would one day pay off the sin debt of the world. Cain approached God with his prayers, but he ignored God's law that says sin must be punished with death. Cain was religious but he was not in a right relationship with God. The law of sin and death still hung over him like a dark cloud. If he did not trust God and his plan, he would never know God as his friend. He would face God as his judge. Ten long generations after Adam first sinned, God gave this sad report on the human family. The wickedness of man was great on the earth, and the thoughts of his heart were only evil all the time. But one family on earth still trusted God. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. For a whole century, Noah built the ark together with his wife, his three sons, and their wives. As he worked, Noah warned the world of God's coming judgment, but people just 
mocked him. Finally, the Ark was ready. On that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. It was the worst natural disaster in history. Except for eight souls sheltered in the ark, all humanity perished. A proud, unbelieving world learned the truth too late. Geological and fossil records affirm the biblical record. From the Sahara to the Himalayas, marine fossils can be unearthed in the world's great deserts and mountains. In His mercy, God is patient, but in His justice, He will judge sin. Do you know the first thing Noah did after his family and the animals came out of the ark? Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. God's justice and mercy had not changed. Sin still required a death payment. That is why Noah shed the blood of innocent creatures and burned their bodies on an altar, suspended between heaven and earth, between God and man. Such sacrifices pointed to the sinless Messiah who would one day come to earth to provide the real payment for sin. Ten generations had passed since the time of the prophet Noah. Satan had a solid grip on the nations, or so it seemed. Instead of trusting in the Lord, people trusted in their religions. Some nations worshiped the sun instead of the one who made it. Others bowed to the moon. The year was about 1925 BC. In a land northeast of Arabia lived an elderly man named Abram. Later, God changed his name to Abraham, meaning father of a multitude. Abraham was 75 years old. Sarah, his wife, was 65 and childless. Their parents and neighbors were idolaters, worshiping created things instead of the Creator. One day, the Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. If Abraham would trust and follow the Lord, he would become the father of a nation from which would come the prophets, the scriptures, and the savior of the world. What did Abraham do? By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. It was not easy for Abraham and his wife to leave their relatives and turn their backs on the family religion yet they chose to endure the criticism of their community in order to follow the one true God. To trust and obey God is not always easy, but it is always best. Abraham and his wife were old and had no children, yet the Lord had promised to make Abraham the father of a great nation. How did Abraham react to God's impossible promise? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Like all of Adam's descendants, Abraham was a sinner. But like Abel and Noah, Abraham offered sin offerings to God. Because Abraham believed the Lord and his promises, God credited righteousness to Abraham's record in heaven and gave him the gift of eternal life. 
Sarah also trusted in the Lord, and God declared her righteous too. But it's hard to wait. After they had been in the land of Palestine for 10 years, hoping and praying that Sarah would get pregnant, they decided to help God fulfill his promise to give Abraham a son. Following a local custom, Sarah gave her Egyptian maid Hagar to Abraham. He slept with Hagar and she got pregnant and gave birth to a son. They named him Ishmael. About 13 years later, when Abraham was 99 and Sarah 89, Almighty God appeared to them again. He told them that they would have a son and call him Isaac. The Lord also told Abraham, As for Ishmael, I will surely bless him, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. A year later, Sarah gave birth to Isaac, the son of the promise. Look at the picture. Do you see Abraham and his wife looking up into the night sky? They are thanking the Lord for his faithfulness. Later, Hagar and Ishmael were sent away, but God was good to them too. God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness of Paran. He became an expert archer and his mother arranged a marriage for him with a young woman from Egypt. Ishmael became the father of the mighty Arab people, whom God has blessed in so many ways. As for Isaac, he remained at home, caring for his father's cattle and flocks. Sometimes Isaac helped his father select a healthy lamb, kill it, and burn it on an altar for their sins. But neither Isaac nor his father could imagine the sacrifice God was about to require. Here is the story straight from the scriptures. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. How could Abraham's son come back if he was to be killed and his body burned? The scripture says, Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. God had promised to make Isaac the father of a new nation through which the promised savior would come. God cannot lie, for Abraham that was enough. Meanwhile, what was Isaac thinking? He knew he was a sinner and that he deserved to die for his sins. He also knew that God would accept a substitute. But today, they were going to a place of sacrifice without a ram or a lamb? It made no sense. So Isaac said to his dad, the fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. 
said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. All these events pictured God's plan to send to earth a holy savior who would satisfy the requirements of the law of sin and death and rescue sinners from every nation on earth. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Why did Abraham name the mountain, the Lord will provide? instead of the Lord has provided? Had not God just provided a ransom? By naming the mountain the Lord will provide, the prophet Abraham was foretelling the day when, on this same mountain, God himself would provide a sacrifice with blood so costly that God would accept it as full payment for the sin debt of the world, so that whoever believes in that sacrifice will not perish, but have eternal life. Some 1900 years after the prophet Abraham offered the ram on the altar, the promised savior himself would look back to this historic event and say, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. As the smoke of the ram rose heavenward, God gave Abraham a glimpse of a future burnt offering that would be sacrificed on this same mountain ridge. Suddenly, Abraham's answer to his son's question, where is the lamb, took on a deeper meaning. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. For Abraham and his son, God had not yet provided the lamb. He had provided a ram. Where was the lamb? At the right time, God himself would provide the answer. Do you remember the two big promises the Lord made to Abraham? First, God had said, I will make you into a great nation. God kept his word. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons whose families became the 12 tribes of Israel. God also said, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God would keep that part of his promise too by working with this special and often rebellious nation. God wanted to show all people on earth what he is like and how sinners can come to him. Whenever God protected this nation, he was protecting his plans to bless you and me. For it was from this nation that the prophets, the holy scriptures, and the promised savior would come. God's secret plan was moving forward. Around 1500 BC, God called Moses, a descendant of Abraham, to be his prophet. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. God also used Moses to lead Abraham's three million descendants away from four centuries of slavery. God himself guided them through the hostile desert with a pillar of cloud to provide shade during the day and with a pillar of fire to provide light at night. By his mighty arm, he opened a path of escape for them in the Red Sea, gave them bread from heaven and water from a rock, and brought them to Mount Sinai. There at the base of the mountain, God told the people, You will be for me a kingdom and a holy nation. God wanted this nation to be holy, set apart for him and distinct from the nations around them. But the people did not understand what it meant to be holy. They did not see themselves as helpless sinners. They thought they could somehow earn God's favor. 
to teach them a lesson about his burning anger against sin, the Lord came down in an earth-shaking display of blazing fire and blasting trouble. Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. God had given Adam one rule. He was about to give this new nation ten. God told Moses that they must obey all ten rules perfectly. Cursed is the man who does not uphold the words of this law. How do you think the people felt after they heard these Ten Commands? Do you think they still thought they were good enough? How about you? Do you think you are good enough to live in God's perfect kingdom? Read again rule number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Do you always put God first? If not, you have failed to keep this law. Read number five, honor your father and your mother. If you have ever disobeyed your father or mother, you are guilty before God. Now look at rule eight, you shall not steal. If you have ever taken something that is not yours or cheated on an exam, you have broken this law. Have you ever told a lie? Then you have not obeyed rule number nine. The last commandment tells us it is wrong even to want to have what belongs to someone else. God sees the sin in our hearts. How many sins did it take to ruin Adam and Eve's relationship with God? Just one. God's perfect standard has not changed. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. God is holy. The Ten Commandments gave the new nation a clear standard of right and wrong. That was a good thing, but God's law also brought bad news. It showed the people that they were in big trouble. Because of their sins, they must all die and be separated from God. The good news was that the Lord would still accept the shed blood of lambs, bulls, goats and doves to cover their sins. And so on the same day that God thundered out his Ten Commandments, God told Moses, make an altar and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings. But this system of offering animal blood for the forgiveness of sins was only a picture of what God really required. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Animals were not created in God's image. The value of a lamb is not equal to the value of a man. Just as you cannot take a toy car to a car dealer and offer it as payment for a real car, so the blood of a lamb could not pay the high price required by the law of sin and death. A better sacrifice was needed. While animal sacrifices could not take away the sin debt of the world. They gave sinners a picture of the one who could. As the time for the Savior's arrival got closer and closer, the Lord told his prophets to write many more prophecies about this Messiah King. Here are a few of those ancient promises. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. But you, Bethlehem, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. He will be called Wonderful, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Your God will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped, then will the lame leap like a deer. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. 
they have pierced my hands and my feet. The promised Savior was coming. But when? And who would he be? How would these prophecies be fulfilled? It was time. After thousands of years of preparation, God was about to send the promised Savior Messiah King into the world. But who would he be? And how would he come? In the time of Herod, king of Judea, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Why did Gabriel call Jesus the Son of God? Some people think this term means that God took a wife and fathered a son. That is not what it means. If you are from the continent of Africa, some may call you a son of Africa. Does this mean Africa got married and had a child no, it means you come from Africa. The Messiah is called the Son of God because he came from God. He came into Adam's sin-ruined family but did not originate from him. He is the very Word, Soul, and Son of God. Do you remember the promise God made on the day Adam ate the forbidden fruit? God had announced that the offspring of a woman would crush the serpent's head. That promised offspring was now in the womb of a virgin girl. How he would crush the serpent's head remained to be seen. 700 years earlier, the prophet Micah had foretold that the Messiah King would be born in Bethlehem, the ancient hometown of King David. But there was a problem. Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth, a three-day journey to the north. How would the scriptures be fulfilled? God had everything under control. As the time approached for Mary to give birth, the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all subjects of the empire must return at once to the city of their ancestors to register to pay taxes. So Joseph and a very pregnant Mary traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There in Bethlehem, overcrowded with weary travelers in town for the tax registration, the promised offspring of a woman was born. The gospel records the event with precision. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. On his mother's side, this baby was the newborn son of Mary. But on his father's side, 
he was the eternal Son of God. The same word by which God created the world. The same voice which thundered from fiery Mount Sinai could now be heard in a baby's soft cry. And where was he born? Not in the palace of a king, not in a hospital, not even in a wayside inn. The king from heaven was born where baby lambs are born, in a barn with a feeding trough for his bed. It was all part of God's plan. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. <laughs> to whom did God first make known the news of the Messiah's coming to earth? To the emperor, the rich and famous, the religious leaders? No, the first to receive the electrifying news were poor shepherds, men who raised lambs to be sacrificed on the temple altar in Jerusalem. There were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. What a story the shepherds had to tell. The Messiah has come. He is here. He is here. Some people believed the shepherd's message. Most did not. But believe it or not, the king, whose birthday split world history in two, had joined the human race. After Jesus' birth in the barn, Joseph arranged to have proper lodging for his little family. One day, some excited magi, wise men who study the stars, arrived in Jerusalem. Led by a special star, these men had come from far away Persia in search of the newborn king. These wise men had one question and one purpose. Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down 
and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Herod tried to murder the child. The people of Jerusalem ignored him, but the Magi, who crossed a scorching desert to find him, worshipped him and gave him gifts fit for a king, gold, incense, and a costly spice for embalming the dead. Why the embalming spice? Did these wise men know that Jesus had been born to die? After the angel's warning, Joseph took Mary and the child Jesus to Egypt, where they lived as refugees until the death of cruel King Herod. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. This fulfilled another ancient prophecy spoken by the Lord. Out of Egypt I called my son. So Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Nazareth, where he grew up along with his half-brothers and sisters. In many ways, the boy Jesus was like other children. He ate slept, played, studied, and learned a trade. But in other ways, Jesus was different from other kids. He was never selfish. He always honored his parents. He never lied. He always pleased his Father in heaven. He was holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. Jesus is the only perfect child in history. Perfect does not mean he never had a skinned knee or a pimple. It means he had a perfect nature. He was perfectly holy and good. He was also perfect in power and wisdom. But before entering Mary's womb, he imposed on himself certain limitations so that he might live as a human among humans. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. When Jesus was 12 years old, he traveled with his parents from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the annual feast of the sacrifice known as the Passover. While his boyhood friends explored the big city, Jesus spent the week in the temple courtyard, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. The temple was the place where lambs were burned on an altar for the sins of the people. The boy Jesus understood what the scholars did not. He had come to offer the last lamb. Thirty years had passed since Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Caesar Augustus was dead. His stepson, Caesar Tiberius, reigned over the Roman Empire. Herod Antipas ruled in Galilee. Pontius Pilate governed in Judea. And a new prophet was preaching in Palestine. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent! for the kingdom of heaven is near. Hundreds of years earlier, two prophets, Isaiah and Malachi, wrote about a future prophet who would announce the Messiah King's arrival. John was that prophet. While the previous prophets had prophesied, at the right time, the promised savior will come to earth. 
John preached. That time has come. The Savior is here. Crowds streamed into the desert to hear John. Those who confessed their condition as sinners in need of the Savior were baptized in the Jordan River. In this way, they showed their faith in the Messiah, who would wash away their great debt of sin and clothe them in his righteousness. Day after day, week after week, John spoke to the people about the long-awaited Savior from heaven, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then one day, the Savior came over the hill, through the crowd, and down to where John was baptizing. John pointed to Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why did John call Jesus the Lamb of God? If you know why, then you know the King's mission. Satan was not happy that this perfect man was living in his kingdom. But the devil had a strategy. Just as he attempted the first man to sin, so now he would try to get this man to sin. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. When Adam sinned, mankind lost the right to rule the earth. Satan had stolen the dominion of the world, making himself its king. Now the king of glory was on earth to take back the dominion, but he would not do it by bowing to the one he had come to crush. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan had never tempted anyone like him, a man who had no desire or capacity to sin. Jesus was different from Adam and his descendants. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. When Satan tempted Adam to sin, Adam lost and Satan won. When Satan tried to get Jesus to sin, Satan lost and Jesus won. The first man led us into Satan's kingdom of sin and death. The second man came to lead us out. In the scriptures of the prophets, one of the Messiah's titles is the arm of the Lord. The miracles of Jesus showed him to be God's arm on earth. With a touch of his hand, or a word from his mouth, the sick and dying were instantly made well. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. The words of the prophets were being fulfilled. The blind received sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. 
When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Jesus did not want the demons testifying about him. These evil angels had witnessed his authority and power when he spoke the heavens and earth into place. They shuddered as they recalled the day he threw them out of heaven. And now he was living on earth as a man. Their master's dominion was crumbling. The king of glory had invaded their domain. Wherever Jesus went, Satan's power was being weakened. Wherever Jesus went, sin's curse was being rolled back. Along with the miracles, Jesus had a message. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus selected 12 men to travel with him and learn from him. Also following him were many women. To those who believed in him, Jesus' call was simple. Follow me. But his call was also costly. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus often taught his disciples how citizens of the kingdom of heaven should live in order to reflect the character and glory of their king. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus was not like the religious leaders who said things like, do this, don't do that, follow these rules, this is the way. Only Jesus could say, I am the way and the truth and the life. Jesus was also different from the prophets who offered sacrifices for their sins and wrote about the coming Messiah. Jesus said, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to fulfill them. Jesus had dominion over every part of creation. Yet he didn't go around saying, Worship me, I am God, I am God. He simply did the things that only God can do and then let people draw their own conclusions. Based on the next two stories, who do you think Jesus is? Jesus went to a town called Nain and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. On another day, Jesus visited two grieving sisters, Martha and Mary. Four days earlier, their brother Lazarus 
had died. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. The Lord Jesus is the only person in history who could say, I am the resurrection and the life. His works proved that his words were true. The teachers and priests of the Jews were not happy to see the crowds listening to Jesus. They wanted the people to listen to them, not him. One day, the chief priests sent their temple guards to arrest Jesus, but they could not do it. When they returned, the priests asked them, why didn't you bring him in? The guards answered, no one ever spoke the way this man does. Not even the prophets spoke like Jesus. The prophets were like candles casting shimmering rays of light in a dark world. But the Messiah was the Son of Righteousness. Who needs candles once the sun has risen? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the word who in the beginning said, let there be light. He is the ultimate source of physical and spiritual light. As the time approached for the Messiah to fulfill his mission, he led three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a high mountain. There, he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. A bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. The disciples never forgot what they saw that day. Later, Peter would write, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John would say, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But for now, the Son's glory would remain hidden in his body of flesh. It was time 
for the king to fulfill his mission. For three years, the Lord Jesus had been traveling around Palestine, doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. The common people loved him, but the religious leaders in Jerusalem were plotting to kill him, and Jesus knew it. It was the eve of the annual feast of the sacrifice called the Passover. The next day, thousands of lambs would be killed. Though Jesus knew that he too would be killed the next day, he spent the evening sharing a last supper with his disciples. At midnight, he led his disciples to a garden called Gethsemane. There, knowing the horrors that awaited him, he prayed to his father. Then, as if on cue, the religious leaders arrived with a mob of armed men. Jesus let the men bind him and lead him to the high priest's house where the Jewish rulers had gathered. There, many men told lies about Jesus. Then, the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. The Jewish court had passed the death sentence, but it did not have the authority to carry it out. Only a Roman court could do that. It was early morning when the religious rulers and a growing mob led Jesus from the high priest's house through the streets of Jerusalem to the palace of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The religious leaders wanted Pilate to put Jesus to death. They began at once to state their case. This man has been leading our people to ruin by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. After interrogating Jesus, Pilate turned to the leading priests and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you were right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But the mob kept screaming, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. But because he was afraid of the religious leaders and their mob, he condemned Jesus to death. Pilate sentenced Jesus to the extreme penalty of Roman law. 
a brutal beating followed by crucifixion. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire battalion. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They made a crown of long, sharp thorns and put it on his head, and they placed a stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery, yelling, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and beat him on the head with it. The soldiers were ignorant of the meaning of the crown of thorns they had jammed onto Jesus' head. Thorns were part of the curse that came over the earth because of Adam's sin. The Holy King of Glory had come to take sin's curse for us. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Two convicted criminals were also led out with Jesus. Each was made to carry his own cross to the place of execution. Part way into the grim parade, the Roman soldiers forced a man from North Africa to carry Jesus' cross for him. Then on they went, through Jerusalem's crowded streets, outside the city walls, and up a hill called Golgotha, the northern part of Mount Moriah where, about 1900 years earlier, the prophet Abraham had said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. It was time for that lamb to die.